The story that I'm about to share with you took place a long time ago. A decade ago, in fact. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure why I've decided to share it now after so many years in silence. I suppose it has something to do with the fact that everybody I knew who could relate to what had happened is gone now. I won't lie to you. A part of me fears that I might be next. I don't expect you to believe me though. I suppose if anybody would believe it, it would be you guys. I decided to post it here because you accept people's experiences without judgment. And because people need to know what had happened. And with a community so large, this is bound to reach somebody. What happens is that I know the truth. And surely, you will too. I suppose it would be helpful for you to know a little bit of background information. A little over 10 years ago, I was a senior in high school. And like many teenagers, I was high off of the feeling of invincibility a driver's license and a car full of friends gave to me. It seems incredible to me that we could have been so incredibly naive. We were so full of ourselves back then. It's a wonder we ever even made it to that road. When I look back at all the stupid stunts that we had pulled, well, you know what they say about hindsight. My buddies and I had a real tight-knit group. A couple of us had been together since the fourth grade. That was me and Tyler. Tyler was a big guy, tall, even when we were little, and bulky too. And although none of us were really jocks, Tyler played on the high school football team. The next two come along was Franco. He joined us in the sixth grade. Everything that Tyler was, Franco wasn't. But he had a sense of humor that rivaled the most gifted stand-up comedians. I used to tell him that he should do stand-up, and he would always make some self-deprecating joke and laugh it off. Jeremy and Corey came last in ninth grade. Those two were as different as day and night, but somehow, their dynamic worked. One was tall and lanky, and perhaps the most responsible of us all. The other was rough, rugged, had a full beard at 14, smote, and used to experiment with a tattoo gun of his own making. And then there was me. I don't know how I fit into the group, honestly. If pressed, I would say it was a sort of combination of the qualities of each of us. Which, now that I think about it, just about sums me up. A jack of all trades, a master of none. Anyway, the five of us were a real tight crew. And despite the fact that we didn't all attend the same high school, it didn't stop us from doing just about everything together. I could tell you stories about adventures in chasing girls, forming bands, facial hair contests, and the wonders of a corncob pipe. But that's not really the point. If you're at all familiar with the greater Delaware Valley, or really anywhere in southeastern Pennsylvania, northern Delaware, or eastern Maryland, then you probably heard the tale of Devil's Road. I know, I know, it sounds like some silly urban legend with a tremble tremble name. And I suppose much of it is just that. A legend. Tales vary wildly from person to person, just about the exact nature of this little stretch of roadway, with everything from satanic cults, inbred DuPonts, they're a rather famous and wealthy family in Delaware state history, and the KKK alternately making appearances in various versions of the legend. A couple of things most of the different versions agree upon include travelers being chased off the road by jeeps or pickup trucks with bright headlights, oddly shaped trees, and a general air of creepiness that permeates the site. Below is a link with a short overview of the general legend and its various incarnations. If you want to poke around on Reddit or YouTube, there are some posts and videos that you can read and or watch to help round out your understanding of the legends in the area. A local radio station has also recently covered the legend. Their write-up is here as well. I think I have successfully proven that this story isn't just some fabrication I made up out of sheer boredom. 
Stories of Devil's Road and the Cult House have abounded for decades, long before I was even born. It's easy, of course, to write off such stories as ridiculous myths or misunderstandings. And while I will agree that some of the tales are clearly deficient, legends tend to have a nucleus of truth to them. In the case of Devil's Road, that nucleus is not to be underestimated. One thing I would like to be very clear on is the exact location of Devil's Road. From time to time, different names have been given as to the location of this bizarre place. Beaver Valley Road was once incorrectly given to me as the name of the entry road. This is again incorrect. The road's true name is Cozart Road. It's not easy to find. Cozart Road is one of those blinking you miss it type of locations. The turn is hidden away from the main road connecting Pennsylvania with Delaware, and there is no longer a street sign identifying the road at all. If you don't know the location already, chances are you won't be able to find it. However, since I've been there more than once, I do know the location. If traveling northbound on Route 52, you want to make a right-hand turn immediately after passing the Fairville Inn. Here's a satellite view of the area. As you can hopefully see, Beaver Valley is just to the southwest of our destination, so perhaps it's understandable why sometimes the names get mixed up. This entire area is a complex web of connecting winding back roads that take travelers off the beaten path and away from civilization. If you're unfamiliar with the area, and don't have a good GPS, it's very easy to get lost back here. And one thing is for sure, you don't want to get lost anywhere near this area. A word of caution, I know many of you enjoy seeking out and exploring places like this. Probably the thrill gives you a rush of adrenaline, right? I do understand. That's what drew us to the road a decade ago. Do not try to drive on Cozart Road. I'm not sharing this story to goad you into going there. I'm sharing it with you for my own reasons and to warn you to stay away. Nothing good can come from ignoring my warnings. Besides, no trespassing signs are posted all over the place. You'd be gambling with the law if you got caught in again. You don't want to get lost or caught in a place like this. As an aside, the Johnston brothers, a notorious Pennsylvania criminal outfit active in the 1970s, murdered three teenage boys and buried their bodies on Cozart Road. Those remains, as far as I'm aware, have never been found. The first time I traveled the road was a summer afternoon in 2008 with Franco and Tyler. We were so excited to experience an urban legend for ourselves that our eagerness outweighed our sense. After all, not much excitement usually happens in our neck of the woods. I guess they can't blame us for wanting a little bit of action. And so, we hopped in my car, my old 1998 Hyundai Elantra, and made the drive in broad daylight. That first trip was uneventful. Nothing of note happened on that first drive other than the fact that we missed our turn like three times and that was before they removed the sign. Except for one thing, each of us seized on immediately. The place had an eerie feel almost as soon as we began to crawl along its path. You might dismiss that as just our imagination. After all, we were kids hopped up on urban legend hype. Of course it would seem eerie to us. Let me elaborate. Route 52, the main road you turn off of to get to Kozar Road, is a busy thoroughfare. You can hear the traffic go by when you make the turn. Once you're on the road proper though, the noise from Route 52 traffic simply ceased to exist. It was as if we had driven into a vacuum where outside contamination wasn't welcome. Like I said before, it was a summer day and we had all windows of the car rolled down for maximum effect on the road. And we heard not one sound. Not one. I still remember Franco's nervous quip like it was yesterday. 
Jeez, who died here? As we traveled slowly down the road, it became painfully clear that this was not a roadway made for convenience. Kozar Road is actually a two-way street, but it's physically impossible for two cars to pass each other. The road is so narrow that it's barely wide enough for a single car. If you do ever happen upon another vehicle, moving in the opposite direction, one of you is going to have to back up a long way down a narrow, winding roadway. Yet another reason I do not recommend trying to find this road. Another strange thing that we had noticed were the trees. The legends had mentioned something about the oddly shaped trees and boy were they odd. Not a single one of them looked like any tree that I had ever seen. The trunks were bent and contorted backwards away from the roadway. You know how trees usually just grow straight up? Well, imagine an endless line of trees on either side of the road contorted crookedly backwards. And even though it sounds crazy, I couldn't help but feel that even nature itself wanted nothing to do with this roadway. I mentioned the unusual silence already. That continued as well. And remember, this was midday on a bright summer afternoon, with all the car windows rolled down. You would think we would have heard birds, squirrels, anything chirping or rustling in this heavily wooded area. But the only sound that we were granted was the sound of our tires as we pressed on through the silence. And that was all that had happened during our first trip. We each agreed that the trees looked weird and the abnormal silence was a bit unnerving. But as far as introductions go, it was a bit disappointing. We didn't see any of these so-called skull trees, and we didn't see any sign of the cult house, and nobody chased us off the road. However, we agreed that we would go back with the whole gang later, at night for maximum spook factor. After bringing Corey and Jeremy up to speed on the legend and our experience taking the road for the first time, everybody was excited to try a nighttime ride. This time, we all packed up into Jeremy's Jeep and prepared ourselves for a late night adventure with an added twist. This time, we weren't just going to drive down Cozart Road, we were going to get out and walk. At this point, I feel I should go into a bit more detail surrounding some of the more gruesome legends about Cozart Road and the Cult House, specifically if you have not yet looked into the links that I provided earlier. The Dupont family patriarch was Pierre Samuel de Dupont de Nemours, 1739-1817. He immigrated to America from France during the French Revolution. His descendants founded some of the most enduring and successful businesses in the Delaware Valley, and by the late 19th century, they were among the wealthiest families in the United States. Patriarch Pierre helped Thomas Jefferson navigate the Louisiana Purchase, and generations later, the DuPont family designed the first secret atomic plants during World War II. The Delaware Valley is littered with institutions bearing the DuPont name, with everything from chemical companies, museums, schools, and children's hospitals bearing the DuPont name and fingerprint. Rumor and scandal have followed the DuPonts from almost the very beginning, up to and including incest, sorcery, and murder. Patriarch Pierre was fond of advocating intermarriage between DuPont cousins to ensure honesty of soul and purity of blood. That much is known for sure. And according to some sources, sometimes the practice extended to siblings. Even generations later, in the early 20th century, the DuPont clan maintained the practice of family marriage despite the rising tendency towards abnormalities in their offspring and a family weakness for tuberculosis. And this brings me back to the story surrounding Cozart Road. Local legend says that the cult house which sits high atop a hill overlooking the abnormal roadway once belonged to the DuPont family. The skull trees refer to locations along the road, beneath the hilltop mansion, where members of the family buried their deformed children or as some versions of the story say, offer the living children as sacrifices. Sacrifices to what is anyone's guess. 
I don't know what I believe about the DuPonts and their involvement in this whole thing. At the end of the day, I can only tell you what I saw and what happened to me directly. I can also tell you that this entire area along the Brandywine River is old. Older than old. European settlement in this area dates back some 400 years, and the indigenous people of the land lived here many centuries before that. Tribes native to the area include the Lenny Lenape, whose name translates to pure original people. In colonial times, native tribes further north in modern day New England likewise referred to the inhabitants of the Delaware Valley as the original people. All of this is information I have learned since, well, I'm getting to that. Nightfall eventually came and with it, the boundless hype of five teenage boys ready for a scary adventure. None of us really expected much, especially after the first trip earlier in the day had been so anticlimactic. At best, we were hoping to maybe get chased by some rednecks in a pickup truck. It would be a cool story to tell at least. Around 10.30pm, we all loaded into Jeremy's Jeep and made our way to the road with the goal of reaching it by 11pm. We made pretty good time and our memory served us well as far as finding the entry point. Once again, traffic noise simply cut out once we had turned onto the road proper. No sound, not even the chirping of crickets, gave life to the humid summer air. As we reached a point about five minutes into our crawling drive, Jeremy stopped the jeep so we could get out and explore. It was the deadest quiet that I have ever heard. Hey, come check this out, Tyler said quickly. We followed him up an embankment where he was kneeling next to a hollow tree trunk. I didn't get a picture of her back then. I didn't own a smartphone in 2008. But I did a little digging and now I have a photo of the exact tree Tyler pointed out. As you can see, the hollow part of the tree has been cemented in. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of reasons why someone might fill in a little tree hollow with cement and brick. I'm sure that on a lonely, isolated road like Cozart Road, a road that is about as convenient to navigate as the US tax code, it makes total sense to fill in a random tree with cement. But for the life of me, I can't think of any. Kozar Road is a quiet, in the extreme sense, back road in rural Pennsylvania that does not get a lot of traffic volume. What purpose does the cement serve? What is it hiding? Hey guys, look up. Jeremy's voice sounded strange almost as if he couldn't quite believe what he was seeing. I looked to see what he was staring at and was completely taken aback. High atop the hill on the road's right stood an enormous house bathed in orange light. Two large windows blazed like orange eyes overlooking the valley, with two large, unmistakably cross-like shapes occupying either window. In the quiet darkness of the valley floor, with contorted trees twisting away from the road, and a cemented in tree trunk just inches away. It was very easy to look up at the house and feel a sense of uneasiness that might have made the whole trip worth it. From this vantage point, with all that orange light and the crosses in the windows, it looked like a genuine haunted house. What made me even more uneasy was that it hadn't been there 10 seconds earlier. And now you could argue, I suppose, that the house had been there all along, and that whoever was inside just hadn't turned on the lights yet. At 11pm, I had a hard time believing that, but you could argue that point. But I had already been there hours earlier in broad daylight. Three of us had, and none of us had noticed a great big manor house with crosses in the windows, looming over top of us when the sun was out. You would think something like that would be difficult to miss. But miss it we did, not once but twice. Call me crazy but I don't think that house was there until Jeremy pointed it out. It was about that time that I began to put some of the pieces together. 
Perhaps it wasn't a coincidence that this tree which someone had gone to such efforts to conceal stood at the base of the manor-topped hill. Thinking back to the stories I had read in preparation for the trip, perhaps there genuinely was something to hide. And that was when the baby cried. Did you hear that? What the hell was that? Shut up, listen. I strained my ears to make sure that I wasn't imagining it. For the first time since we had turned onto the road, there was sound coming from somewhere other than us. The unmistakable wails of a crying baby. It was muffled, as if it was coming from somewhere some ways off. But it was no mistake. All five of us heard it. I slid down the embankment closer to the jeep to see if I could hear it better from there but, if anything, the cries just grew fainter still. Taking their cue from me, the others climbed down off the embankment and we all piled back into the car. You might think us cowardly for not investigating the sound further. What if there was an actual baby in distress? My guess is that whatever we heard was something beyond our help. The jeep moved at a crawl as we craned our necks to look up to the house on the hilltop. There didn't seem to be any driveways or access roads, so it was a bit of a mystery as to how anybody actually got up the hill to get into the house. We would have kept looking up for who knows how long, had it not been for the ungodly thunder that ripped through the air, making our jeep rattle and shake like a tin box on wheels. The sound was by far the loudest, most earth-shaking rumble I had ever heard. It sounded like a freight train was roaring through the air above us. The look we all shared with one another as we tried to figure out the source of the ungodly noise and the grind from before was one of confusion and fear. We had come here to be freaked out and entertained. The road was paying us in fear. At someone's urging, I forgot who it was, Jeremy kicked his jeep into gear and began to drive away a little faster than before. The rumbling had stopped as suddenly as it had begun, leaving the night deathly still and quiet once more. We nearly crashed when Jeremy slammed his feet on the brakes as something came out from the tree line on our left and into the middle of the road. A goat stood there looking at us. It was pale white and would have stood out in the darkness even without our headlights shining on him. It wore no collar and no bells. It didn't chew its cud like goats tend to do. It simply gazed at us, and we at it. It seemed to look right through us. I've never been frightened by a farm animal before, but I didn't like that thing one bit and I felt like it didn't care for us either. We sat there in silence, Five teenage boys staring down a pale goat on a deserted road that had given us more than our share of creeps for the night. And then it bleated at us. It was the worst sound that I had ever heard in my life. It bleated the sound of a crying baby. I sat there transfixed as this creature replayed the wails that we had heard earlier while investigating the sealed up tree. It bleated continuously. Each new sound louder and more aggressive in its agony than the one that came before it. Our ears rang with the plaintive whining of frightened babies so loudly that we actually covered them with our hands. Franco buried his head in his arms and shuddered in his corner in the back seat. When it was over at last, the goat gave us one last piercing stare. I could have sworn that it smiled. Without warning, it took off up the hill in the direction of the mansion. None of us said anything for a long while. We simply sat there burning gas for a minute, Jeremy's foot never leaving the brakes. I was the first one to snap out of our collective stupor, and when I did, I was in for a surprise. Jeremy, I asked quietly, is your clock right? He nodded. Why? It says 3.30 in the morning. I think you must realize that everything I've described so far did not take four and a half hours to transpire. 
Yet according to his clock, it had been four and a half hours since we had turned onto Kozar Road at 11 p.m. We each checked our phones, only to be greeted with another surprise. Each of our phones had a different time. Jeremy's phone matched the time of his Jeep. Corey's red, 115. Tyler's, 236. Franco's, 319. Only mine read anything like what the real time actually was. 12.04 AM. I've long thought about that little point and I think I finally understand what it meant. If I'm right, perhaps it's a good thing I'm sharing my story now. Utterly unnerved and more than a little terrified, we sat in silence as Jeremy spurred the jeep to drive a little further down Cozart Road and hopefully towards its end. We had just rounded a little bend in the road when the rear view filled up with blinding white light. From what little I could see, our tail was being closely followed by a caravan of dark SUV type vehicles with their high beams switched on. I don't know where they could have come from. There is nothing on either side of the road but woods. There was nowhere for the SUVs to come from, and they certainly hadn't been behind us the whole time. But despite how little I understood it, the fact remained that they were behind us now, moving at high speed with high beams blazing. We screamed at Jeremy to move faster, and he frantically played with the clutch to get the Jeep moving as quickly as possible. The caravan was gaining on us rapidly. The jeep was filled with sounds of frantic yelling, cussing, swearing, and the general cacophony of chaos. We had come to play on Devil's Road, but the road had turned out to play with us. Eventually, we did arrive at the end of the road, hanging a hard right onto Creek Road. The caravan stopped short after we made our turn, not bothering to follow us anymore. For reasons I've never fully understood, Jeremy stopped the jeep as well with the caravan still in view. We each looked back behind us at the last few hundred feet of Kozar Road, illuminated under the bright lights of the high beams, and a pale goat emerged from the hill on our right. It stood bathed in the light of the caravan, and once more stared intently ahead at us. It did not blink, it did not chew. And when it opened its mouth, we heard the unmistakable screams of a woman in sheer agony, and the pained words chose. No, 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 no please, please, no. no. A baby cried as we drove away, leaving Cozart Road behind us. As I said, over a decade has passed since that night spent on the road. Franco and I tried to talk of it a few times to make sense of it. We never could, and the others would never speak of it again. After high school, we each went our separate ways. It's amazing how so many years of friendship can so easily vanish. Some might say that it was always bound to happen once we didn't have the glue of high school keeping us together. I don't exactly agree. We didn't all go to the same school to begin with. We had always dealt with that separation rather well. It's frankly astounding to me how it all fell apart in just a few months after graduation. If I'm honest with you, I blame the road for some part of it. Maybe that's stupid, but I can't help but feel that it stole something from us that night. Those sounds, those images that we couldn't explain. I wondered what would happen of us if we had never gone there at all. Corey died at 22 years old. Tyler followed not long afterwards. For a while, Franco, Jeremy, and I tried to rekindle whatever we had had in the wake of losing our friends. It didn't last. All the humor had gone out of Franco. And Jeremy, our pillar of responsibility had experienced a personality downturn of bipolar proportions. He knocked up a girl, ran off, and shut himself off from the world. They found his car a year ago on the Brandywine River, his body still strapped into his seatbelt. And for Franco, 
Not long before Jeremy's crash, Franco took up a job as a landscaper. He said it paid well. In fact, he had seemed happier than I had seen him in years. It was like seeing a glimpse of the old Franco. He used to make me laugh so much. They found him hanging from a contorted tree on Cozart Road last summer. Now that each of them had passed, I now believe I understand the meaning of our clocks that night on the road. Only one clock kept the right time. Only one person has lived long enough to have a reasonably happy life. Only one person has kept going long enough to tell you what had happened, and hopefully to convince you to leave well enough alone. Because nothing good can come from chasing after legends. Recently I decided to do the unthinkable. Early this past autumn, I returned to Cozart Road. The roadside had been taken down, but I would never forget this place. I wasn't foolish enough to go at dark this time. I decided to go alone in broad daylight. I would be dragging no one along with me this time. The road sign isn't the only thing that has been removed. I knew from my research and participation in online forums that Kozar Road had seen an increased police presence in recent years. They say it's because residents of the quiet, peaceful street have complained about unruly adventure seekers disturbing the peace. I don't really believe that's really it, but that probably does play a minor role. The cement tree has been cut down, and this is what it looks like now. If the police sought to end the mystery of this place by cutting down the tree, they were sadly mistaken. The mystery endures. The mansion on the hilltop was nowhere to be seen, something I expected in the broad daylight. Whatever makes its abode here is a being of night and shadow. I'm certain of it now. I don't know what involvement, if any, the DuPonts have ever had in the mystery of Cozart Road. It's possibly they were only scapegoats this entire time for something far bigger and more ethereal than themselves. But then again, Maybe those rumors have followed them all these centuries for a reason. Maybe they do have a role to play. Then again, maybe the family DuPont, who cast so long a shadow in my local history, and in American history in general, are merely pawns in something larger. Maybe it was a coincidence that the Johnston brothers killed those kids and buried them here, and not somewhere else. Maybe it's a coincidence that the last known locations of each of my friends was either on this road or very close by before their bodies were found, but I doubt that. One thing my research has taught me, this place is old, older than the United States, older than Pierre Samuel DuPont, older even than the pure original people who once roamed this land. Whatever is here, it was here before us, and it will be here after us. And that's especially true if you think you would like to play with Devil's Road. The road is not a toy to be explored for your amusement. We learn that to our sorrow. A pity that I'm the only one left who maybe understands it truly. I drive near Cozart Road every day on my way to work. I even used to take Creek Road, that roadway that connects to Cozart, and that we turned down to in our haste all those years ago to escape a convoy of SUVs and a pale goat. You better believe I was thrilled when I found a slightly faster way to work that didn't involve getting so close to Cozart. When I returned last fall, I didn't linger on that road long. I didn't even leave my car to take pictures of the tree stump. I drove along quietly, observing what I could, seeing less than I remember, and treating the road with much more respect than my 17-year-old self ever would have. This time, there is no high-beam chase, there is no screaming woman, there is no crying baby. It was almost peaceful. The only thing that stood out came near the end of the road, near the intersection with Creek. In my rearview mirror, 
I could have sworn I saw a pale head sticking out of the trees, and the faint sound of Franco's laughter coming from in between the horns. My name is Joseph Cooper. I was a police officer in the town of Jimsville, Tennessee. If you're curious why the town doesn't show up in any Google search results, I'm going to tell you why. It was an ordinary day at the station. I was doing my usual rounds of paperwork before heading home. Susan, one of the 911 operators, informed me about a call from a man named Marshall. The reason being an attempted at child abduction. Alright, I'll take care of it. I said, getting in my cruiser. It was a five minute drive to get to his house. Two other officers were already there. The distraught man was speaking to them about the incident. I walked up to him to ask him about what had happened. He told me that a man had emerged from the bushes when his seven year old daughter, Josie Flynn, was playing on her swing set. The description of the subject was that of a fairly tall, average-built Caucasian man, in his mid-twenties with short, well-capped brown hair and blue eyes. His outfit consisted of black and one shoes, blue jeans, a brown long sleeve shirt, and a gray mask that covered his mouth, and strangely, only his mouth. When the man tried to do something to his daughter, he quickly stormed outside. After seeing the angered father, the man quickly sprinted back into the woods. He took his daughter into the house and called the police, which led to the current moment. Marshall noted the man had a maw of razor-sharp triangular teeth and no lips. And that last part sent a chill down my spine. My colleagues on the scene thought that he was on something, but that look on his face convinced me that he wasn't lying. The next couple of days, several women disappeared, and two bodies were found mauled and partially eaten in the forest. The sheriff feared that a bear had gained a taste of human flesh and was hunting the townsfolk. I objected to that since the injuries on the autopsy report definitely weren't from a bear, of course, they ignored me and the deaths were reported as animal attacks. The following Saturday, I was enjoying one of the few days off I had while my wife Chloe was at work. I was lounging on my easy chair watching the movie The Revenant, drinking a beer to temporarily forget about the recent murders. My daughter Sarah, who was 16 at the time, arrived home from her gymnastics practice. She gave me a big hug as usual when she got home. When she walked upstairs to change out of her clothes, I walked to my fridge to get another Miller Lite. I suddenly heard the ear-piercing scream of Sarah from her bedroom. I rushed up the stairs and into her room, practically ramming the door down. What's wrong? I asked in an urgent tone. There was a man outside. He was watching me change, Sarah said, tearing up. Did you see what he looked like? I asked. Not really, but he had brown hair and a gray face mask on his mouth, Sarah said. My heart sank to my chest when she said that. It was for sure the same man from the previous case. Stay here, I said going to my bedroom to retrieve the Remington shotgun from my closet. I went out to the backyard, pumping the shotgun as I yelled for whoever it was to come out with their hands up. There was no response. I searched the entire yard for three minutes to find no one in sight. Although I know Sarah would never lie about something like that, I went back into the house to comfort her until their mother returned. Now that the same man from the Marshall Flynn case paid me a visit, I was fully convinced that he was responsible for the killings. 
And sure enough, the following Tuesday, the remains of a missing young boy, Jared Hancock, age 10, were found in the forest preserve. His lower torso was completely missing. The smell of decaying flesh hung in the hot air. Even the homicide detective, Joshua Rogers, vomited his lunch upon seeing the poor boy. You got a clue of what the hell did this, I said. To be honest, I have no idea myself. Whatever did this definitely was an animal. A person chopping this boy in half isn't a far stretch, but there's no way they would bother with such a precise cut, Joshua said. So what the hell does that mean? I said. That whatever we're dealing with is something supernatural, I'm sure of it, Joshua said. Even though I believed him somewhat, there was no way in hell we would have been able to convince the superintendent or the sheriff. I and Joshua left the crime scene to execute the grim task of informing the Hancocks of their son's death. They predictably sobbed uncontrollably, Miss Hancock especially. After they calmed down, Joshua asked them questions regarding their son's disappearance while I was using the bathroom. They said Jared was spending the night at a friend's house. When they were playing in the backyard was when he went missing. Before we left, Miss Hancock pleaded with us to find the monster that had brutalized her son. We promised to do whatever we could to find them. When we left, I was welcomed by Sheriff Michael Douglas leaning against my office door. Hey, Sheriff, what's up? I said. Oh, hey. I don't know how to say this, but I came down here to tell you something from the superintendent. You've been relieved of your service, Michael said. You're saying I've been fired. After the ten years I've spent here, I said, angered by the fact that I've lost my job so suddenly and without any rational explanation. Man, calm down. I had no hand in it, Michael said. All right. How about you go tell the superintendent to kiss my ass? I said, throwing my badge on the ground as I walked off. After I got home, I opened the Jack Daniels bottle I bought and I poured myself a glass. I don't understand. Why did they just fire you? Chloe asked. I'm as much in the dark as you are, but I think I have a good suspicion. It's because of this mystery man that we're trying to track down. I must have known too much of what they're trying to cover up, I said. But despite losing my job, my promise to Miss Hancock was still there. Job or no job, I would hunt down whoever or whatever it was that was killing these people. Well, I know what will make you feel better, Chloe said, taking me four seconds to figure out the implication. Since Sarah was visiting a friend, I figured why not. I won't go into too much detail for obvious reasons. We were about to get into things when I heard a knock at the door. I immediately stopped what I was doing to walk towards it. Is that Sarah? Chloe asked, somewhat frightened. It can't be. Whatever happens, stay right behind me, okay? I said to Chloe, grabbing my hunting knife from a hidden compartment in my nightstand. When I slowly opened the door, it was Joshua, surprisingly in civilian clothing. Whoa, man, it's just me, Joshua said after seeing me with the knife. Oh, uh, sorry, I thought you were the thing. I said embarrassed while my wife was putting her shirt back on. I sheathed the knife and I hooked it out of my belt holder. Was I interrupting something? Joshua said, hiding a little smile. Oh, no, not at all. Please come on in. I said as I shut the door after he walked in. You want a coffee? I asked Chloe. Sure, thanks, Miss Cooper. 
Joshua said as he sat on the sofa while I sat across on my easy chair. Well, man, you won't believe this. They fired me the day after you, Joshua said. You too? This seals it. They know something that we don't. I said as Chloe gives Joshua his coffee. That's what I was thinking. The way I see it, we are going to have to hunt down this thing ourselves. And I know just the guy who can help us out. Joshua said. Who? I asked. Old man Perkins. Joshua replied. You mean that Vietnam veteran, Rodney Perkins? I said. Yup. Word around town is that he's a bit nutty, but still pretty dependable. He told me yesterday that he thought he saw our suspect by a creek near the forest preserve and said that he would come along with us in our hunt. Joshua said. He saw it? I asked. Apparently so, Joshua said. Well, every second wasted here is another person dead, so we should head out now, I said. After I packed my gear, I kissed my wife goodbye as I and Joshua left to Perkins' house. It took a good hour to get there, and his house was surprisingly clean and well kept. We knocked and we were welcomed by Rodney, who shook our hands and welcomed us in as he went to get his duffel bag. He was quite good looking for an old man. He's 70, but he looks and moves like he's 50. We wasted no time as we left in our vehicles. He trailed behind us in his red pickup truck as we drove to the preserve which was closed. When we parked, Rodney got out his M14 rifle out of the back of his pickup truck. I had my Remington shotgun, and Joshua had his favorite Glock pistol. Alright boys, let's bag this son of a bitch and head home, Rodney said. Easier said than done, Joshua said as we ventured into the forest. We continued walking until we finally got to the creek, which had a sewage tunnel connecting to it. Hey guys, look, I said, seeing something shiny in the water. The smell of rotting flesh intensified as we got closer to a bloated corpse in the water, which we strongly assumed was one of the missing women. Jesus Christ, I said, try not to vomit. Look at that. There's a paper in its chest cavity, Joshua said. Despite it being in the water for God knows how long, the paper was still dry. The text written in blood said, Getting warmer. The fact that this thing could write a note meant it was definitely a lot smarter than a mere animal. As we walked into the sewage tunnels, Joshua turned on his high-powered flashlight to navigate the dark-ass tunnels down there. The raw sewage smell was so intense me and Roddy almost fell over. Ten minutes later, we found a natural light source coming from another tunnel. We walked out there to see we were now in a deeper part of the forest. We all shit ourselves when we saw the suspect, who was no longer wearing his face mask revealing a lipless mouth with teeth resembling that of an anglerfish. This confirmed that this thing was definitely not a person, or anything that could possibly be natural. Somehow Josh I still had the balls to tell him to put his hands up, which only made the beast laugh. Oh, not to worry. I only summoned you all here to talk. Said the creature, who was obviously lying, but his voice was surprisingly soothing and calm for being quite deep. If that's so, tell us what the hell your name is, Rodney said. He paused for a second, seeming surprised as if it was the first time that somebody asked his name. I have many names, but you may call me Wahasha. I had no idea at what the hell that name meant, but I knew that it was Arabic. 
Now that that's out of the way, why are you eating our locals? Joshua asked. I saw him clenching his fist, barely containing his rage towards this unearthly thing. Oh, it's nothing personal. It's just the taste of your flesh is so satisfying. It's like what you humans call pigs. It's the best I've had since I crashed on this planet. Wahasha said. His choice of words genuinely unnerved me. Crashed? What do you mean by that? I asked. Well, I guess I have no reason to hide anything now, so I'll tell you. Seven million years ago, I had crashed in an asteroid on this planet, when humans were just starting to appear. I hibernated until the first civilization started popping up on Earth. I eventually woke up and started feasting on whatever I could eat, including humans around 3100 BC, before hibernating again around AD 226. I eventually settled down on the landmass that would eventually become this little shithole town. After waking up again in 1837, I routinely fed on the locals here before I hibernated again. And now, here I am. Strangely, not even I fully know my own origin. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This thing was a damn alien. Old as humanity itself, probably older. Rodney's mouth was dropped the whole time by what we were hearing. So then why did you kill the little boy, huh? Why him? I yelled. That, I have no obligation to answer. Wahasha replied. An enraged Josh probably shot him in the chest with his pistol. Wahasha screamed in pain as purple blood oozed from his wound sizzling like acid when it dropped to the ground. Black horns then started to grow from his head. His mouth opened wider as he sprinted at an inhuman speed towards Rodney, clearly pissed off. He tackled Rodney to the ground, trying to bite his neck with his large jaws. I fired my shotgun at it in a vain attempt to get it off. Josh tried to pull him off, only to be smacked to the ground with his hand, which now had elongated, sharpened claws. After one more shotgun blast to its back, it finally got off of Rodney. It dropped to the ground in a mangled mass from my shotgun blast. Did you get him? Rodney asked. I think so, I said. Suddenly his hair began to fall off its head, as its skin turned to light gray with a hint of purple, and then it suddenly turned into some frail, gargoyle-like thing. No, please, spare me, begged Wahasha, coughing up purple blood as it tries to limp away. After all of those innocents you killed, you think you're entitled to mercy, Josh yelled. It let out a little whimper as Rodney finished it with a headshot from his M14. As its body, strangely, started to dissolve, a maggot-like creature burrows underground. I didn't know if it was bad or not because all we cared about was getting the hell out of there before the police had arrived. To this day, I still don't know how that thing went down so easy. I moved out of that godforsaken town a month later, even though I have Josh and Rodney's number so we could always keep in touch. If you guys were expecting more thrilling mystery stuff, then you must have been disappointed. He was getting a hell of a lot cockier, and so he felt no need to hide anything anymore. Four years later and my daughter is now 20, and taking online college classes, I had to go to a rehab center to help me quit my excessive drinking from the unnatural horrors that I had witnessed. The only reason I'm still here to tell this story is because of my amazing wife and my child. If you want to speculate what the hell that thing was, that would be a great help too. I just hope to God that that monster is dead for good.
I've heard a lot of stories from my grandfather. He was a detective for 27 years of his life, and I grew up listening to the tales of he and his fellow lawmen. As a child, he obviously amended the stories quite a bit to make them age appropriate. But as I grew up, more and more of the true stories came out. Starting about two years ago, my grandpa got sick. He's been on a slow decline ever since, and while it's been one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with, his illness acted as the catalyst for a set of stories he'd never before brought up. He said that he had kept them filed away deep in the folder he doesn't like to open. He calls them the impossible ones. But this last one, the one that he told me last night, he said it's the one that still keeps him up some nights, the one that he thinks about every day. He said he looked over the case files more times than he can remember, done a full re-examination of it all more times than he can remember, and it never makes any more sense. He says he only told me now because he can feel in his bones that he doesn't have a lot of time left. I recorded him telling me the story, so what follows is my transcription of the case verbatim. I've only excluded his coughing fits and any off-topic remarks made during the telling of the case. The case was a murder kidnapping, at least that's what it looked like, and it was me and Olsen. I've told you about him. There is a family, the Nebels. There was Benjamin, the husband, Jennifer, the wife, and Katie, their six-year-old daughter. One of their neighbors had gone out for the paper around 6 a.m. and saw the Nebels' front door wide open. When she went over to see if everything was okay, she saw the wife's body. The neighbor called 911 and eventually we were sent over there. Now, when I say there is no outward signs of a struggle, I mean it. There is no sign whatsoever that anything had happened. Well, except for the dead body. But even her body, there were no wounds, no marks of any kind. I'm getting ahead of myself. On our way to the house, it came over the radio that the husband and daughter were unaccounted for. If you're thinking the husband did it, we did too, obviously. Problem was, both the family's cars were still in the garage, so we think they might have left on foot. Some officers canvassed the neighborhood, and no one had seen them, including two neighbors that were on their porches for hours starting in the early morning. No one had heard any kind of commotion coming from their house, either. I mentioned the wife's body. She didn't have a hair out of place. She was on her back in the kitchen. About a third of her upper body was under the table. We found out after the autopsy that, well, she had just died. There was no cause that they could find. She had been a perfectly healthy woman. Didn't smoke, didn't drink ate right, exercised. It was like she had just blinked her eyes and gone from alive to dead. Anyways, we searched the house. We went through it with a fine tooth comb, basement to attic, found nothing. No evidence of a struggle, no weapon, nothing. And so we left. We had spent hours in the house, thought maybe we should come back in a day or two with some fresh eyes. We went over to where Benjamin worked. He was a supervisor at a lumber yard. According to his co-workers, 
He had shown up at work that morning just before 5 a.m. When he got in, he worked on this narrow crate thing that he was building in his office. Something he had told his co-workers was a project for his house. According to the other morning supervisor, he had only built about half of the thing. Around 6.15, he said he was running to the bathroom, and that was the last anybody saw him. They never saw him leave. While we were at the lumber yard, I realized that I had left my note at the house. We drove back over there, and we got there while they were taking the wife's body away. As soon as we had walked in, the stench hit us like a bus. It was, well, it was what a newly discovered but long dead body smells like. We knew it obviously couldn't have been the wife. We asked a few of the officers and forensic folks that were still at the house what the smell was. And they told us that it had only started a few minutes before we had gotten back there. I'm not exaggerating when I say the smell was everywhere in the house. I've smelled some dead ones before, but this smelled like every wall in the place was lined with corpses. Pretty quickly, we found that the smell was strongest leading up to the attic. And now I told you before, we had checked the attic. I checked it myself probably five times. But we went back up. Me and Olsen. I was up the little pull down ladder first, and when I poked my head up, I saw something. I saw a piece of wood, like a box, you know, a crate. It was shaped kind of like a rifle case, maybe three feet tall, two feet wide, maybe six inches deep, rectangular. It was standing straight up, and there was blood leaking from it. We called the photographers and all the people in there. They all do their thing, and finally, they pull out all the nails and open the box. Out falls the husband. Think about that. This guy was maybe 5'10", 140 pounds and he was put in a 3 foot by 2 foot by 6 inch crate. His bones were just a mess. His insides, all of his organs, they were flattened. They were just wet, squishy pieces of fabric, almost. He was stuffed in there like, I don't know what like. He was just a rectangle of blood, skin and parts. His skin had the discoloration of a body that had been dead for about two weeks, which obviously didn't make any sense, since they had seen him at work that morning. He was also missing his eyeballs. We were standing there, trying to rationalize the whole situation, when something caught everyone's ears at the same time. A little girl's voice calling out for help. What followed was a sequence of all the people in the attic, and the rest of the house, and the people out on the lawn, and the few people that were standing on the other side of the yellow tape, all saying some variation of the phrase. It sounds like it's coming from over there. The problem was, every single person swore they had heard it coming from a different direction. Me. I heard it from right above me, no kidding. The first time I heard that little voice say, help me, I looked straight up, right up to the rafters. Of course she wasn't there. It was just my brain's response to where I perceived her voice was coming from. We had to listen to every one of these people tell us where they thought they heard her voice coming from. People swore up and down they heard it coming from the kitchen cabinets, the bedroom closet, the refrigerator, the tank behind the toilet for God's sake. People on the street said 
they had heard it from underneath cars, behind trees, on the sides of the houses next to the Nebels. Everyone heard her voice for about a minute and a half, two minutes tops, and then it just stopped. About two weeks after that day, the wife's sister had a funeral for Jennifer. It went fine. They buried her and all that. The husband's remains were cremated not long after that and put on display in a different part of the cemetery. I don't remember exactly when it happened, but at some point, over the few weeks after he was cremated, someone stole his urn. It was missing for about six months, and then one day we get a call, find out a groundskeeper at the cemetery had called in. The wife had been dug up and posed like she was leaning against the grave, just relaxing. She had the urn in her hands, but it was wrapped in skin. Well, they tested it, and it was the husband's skin. They had pretty well reconstructed the man after he poured out the crates, and he hadn't been missing any skin. And remember I told you that his skin was discolored? Well, this skin was perfectly preserved. And inside the urn, with his ashes, there were three eyeballs. Only one of them was the husband's. It's been, what, 22 years? I still hear that girl's voice calling out sometimes. And I don't mean my memory or mind is playing tricks on me. Ask your grandmother. She's heard it. The same six-year-old voice. And then I remember, it was May 12th, 2007. I was going to pick up a pizza for us. I saw that girl. I saw Katie Nebel. I don't mean I saw her grown up. I don't mean I saw a little girl that looked like her when she was young. I mean I saw that fucking kid. She was standing outside the Walgreens right by our old house, crying. I pulled over and I got out of the car, and I started to walk up to her. I can't explain how I felt in that moment. I was nauseous. I was so, so afraid. Terrified. More than I've ever been. She looked right at me and said in that same voice, Help me, please. please. I don't know what the hell happened, but she just disappeared. I never took my eyes off of her. She was just there one second, gone the next. I thought I was losing my mind. I was seriously worried about my mental health. But then, about an hour after I got back home, the phone rang. It was Olsen. I hadn't talked to that son of a bitch in five years, and he called me that night. Said that he saw Katie Nebel sitting on a bus stop bench, crying. He lived on the other side of the country. He killed himself the next day. <sighs> there is never a good ending to these stories, I know. If there was, they wouldn't be the impossible ones. I would have figured them out one way or the other. And I know I've told you some others, but that girl's voice still wakes me up in the middle of the night. Sometimes I hear it from downstairs, sometimes from the bathroom. Sometimes I'll be laying on my side, facing away from your grandmother, and it'll sound like it's coming from her mouth. We never found a trace of that girl, nothing. I told you what they do with those cases. 
the... God damn it. I, uh, I'm sorry. Let's... That's it. That's the worst one. Some of the other ones might sound worse to you, but that's the worst for me, okay? He told me that he didn't want to talk about it anymore, and said now that he told me, he would never talk about it again. I was very young when this happened. I don't remember much. I suppressed most of the memories from those months. Now, I won't bore you. I want to get this out. I know what will happen when I post this. They know who I am. They just never thought that I would speak. They were wrong. I'm just going to cut to the chase. April 23rd, 2008. I had just turned 13 when my parents had died. The cop knocking on the door, my grandmother hearing the news and sobbing her eyes out. The crash, the fire. I lost it. I stood in my room, moping for hours. I couldn't handle the stress. I was a blank face for weeks. Nothing seemed to be enjoyable anymore. My grandmother got very worried. She took me to see a grief counselor a week later, and I was diagnosed with depression. I went about my day as well as I could, going to school, eating out with friends. It could have been pleasant if I wasn't forced to by the counselor. How I hated her. As usual, I was walking home from counseling like every other Wednesday. I was tired and I just wanted to get home and sleep. I was not one for talking about emotions and I hated every session. I turned down onto Harper Street when the black minivan rolled up next to me. It was a slow night in November and nobody was out on this quiet road. The minivan abruptly stopped next to me. Men in comfy clothes hopped out. Hey kid. Stop, one in a hoodie said. He had the hood down, covering his face in dark shadow. I faced them. What do you want? You're coming with us, he said flatly. No, screw off. I started walking again at a quicker pace. I heard the van start rolling after me. And then I was slammed to the ground. I knew what their intentions were. At first I did, but I would not expect what was to come. I felt the sack go over my head, and I squirmed as they lifted me and tossed me into the van. I tried screaming out, but one of them socked me in the face. I went out. I woke up to find myself still in the car, my hands tied. Everything was jet black under the sack. How long had I been out? I could hear the men in the car talking. My head rang and I couldn't make out everything though. The car made a sharp right and I rode against the door and I groaned in pain. The men didn't react. I don't know how long I was in that car. It could have been hours or just a minute. Time was irrelevant at that moment. After however long had passed, the car stopped. I heard the door slide open and click. I was picked up by my arms and dragged out. I could hear lots of chatter and voices. I heard screaming and crying. And then I was tossed into a small room. The sack was ripped off. But before I could get a look at the face of my captors, the door slammed shut. I was in a small room with padded walls and a small cot with no sheets. What the hell? I looked through the tiny window of the door first thing. What I saw shocked me. Other doors stretched down the hall as far as the eye could see. At least that's what I could see from my window. 
Other eyes stared hatefully from the other windows. I looked at them in a trance. What had these people been through? Why us? I saw two men in black with helmets walking down the halls, guns at their sides. I ducked back down as I saw the others do the same. I cowered in the corner as one of the guards looked through the tiny window. He sneered and he walked on. I heard a commotion down the hall. An irritated voice rang out. I heard fast-paced footsteps running back towards me. The guard came back, fumbling with his keys. He opened the door and he rolled his eyes. He had pale skin and a slight stubble. He grimaced down at me and he hoisted me up. He grabbed a sack from a hook on his belt. No, no, no! I cried out as he put it over my head. I struggled and I managed to land a kick to his ribs. He let out a loud grunt and shoved me against the wall. Another guard rushed in. The second guard pinned me to the wall as the first guard put the sack over my head. What do you want from me? Please! I screamed. They tossed me on some sort of cart. They didn't talk through the entire process. The cart made multiple twists and turns. And then I was hoisted up again and I was carried into a separate room. They sat me down in a chair. I felt the cold steel wrap around my wrist. I winced under the sack. The guards left the room and they slammed the door shut. Minutes later, the sack was ripped off my head. I gasped in the fresh air. I looked up to see a middle-aged woman in a chair opposite of me. She wore a pantsuit and glasses. She looked at me calmly. Another guard stood on her left, staring me down grimly. Did I do something wrong? I murmured. She didn't say anything. Did I do anything wrong? I was cut off. Hello there, Peter. I assume you're very thirsty right now. Would you like a drink? She offered calmly. I shook my head. All right then. Do you know why you're here? She asked. I shook my head again. Well, I can't be super specific, but I'll try to explain. So our government is trying to cure multiple rare diseases. You know that, right? I nodded. Well, what we do here is to try to cure those diseases. We've cured Ebola and even some minor forms of cancer. However, only some of these vaccines work. This research facility is where we test out these vaccines, she explained. By kidnapping children. The words came out before I could think. Her calm demeanor faltered. She looked at me with steely eyes. I suppose. I didn't look at her. I stared down at my dirty clothes. The guard spoke up. Look up. The woman started speaking again. We're going to be testing a vaccine on you tomorrow morning after some prep. You will go through a three-step process. Part one is decontamination. You will be cleaned thoroughly and will be wiped of any bodily issues. Part two is preparation. You will be put into a special tubing and will be put in a chamber to avoid spreading of disease through bodily fluids. You will have an airtight mask as well. Part three is injection. You will be briefed once you complete part two. I didn't speak. This was absurd. Do you understand? She asked. I nodded. Good. Lance Corporal, you may take him back, she said to the guard. The guard grabbed me without saying a word and put yet another sack over my head. I grimaced as I heard the door open. I thought about my grandmother and my friends at school. What were they thinking? I had been gone for hours, but who knows how long. 
I thought about all of this until I was tossed into the cell. The cold concrete floor is scraping my arm as I landed. I let out a soft cry and the sack was pulled off my head. The door slammed shut and I just sat there. I must have sat there for hours, thinking about what was happening to me, and where I was, and how I should have run faster. I didn't sleep very much. I woke up to the sound of a door opening. It was loud and metallic and it came open with a crash. Two guards came in. The two from the first time. The first guard put the sack over my head. I struggled as usual. However, the second guard took pity on me. Take it off. and We'll take the safe route. The first guard replied. No, we were told to keep him blind. What do you want me to do? Hold his eyes shut for him? The sack was suddenly ripped off my head and the air greeted me. I looked up at the guards. The first one was pissed and the second was equally pissed at the first guard. Alright kid, you're gonna see some nasty stuff. It's not like you'll live to tell, the first guard said. The second guard nudged him and the first guard stopped talking. Even in the horror of the situation, I could feel the awkwardness. They hauled me up by my arms and sat me on the awaiting cart. It was like a golf cart, but with a large bed at the back and no roof. They drove down the hall for what must have been half a mile. The little rooms lined the hall. Inside of every room were hateful little eyes. I couldn't make out any faces. It was too dark inside those lightless rooms. The car turned on the hall opposite to the room where the lady explained the situation, if you could call it that. The car abruptly stopped. Alright, you will need to wear the sack for this part, the second guard said. And then the sack came over my eyes. We walked and walked and walked, and then the sack was ripped off. I was alone in a tile room. I looked around. A single dingy light bulb sat in the center of the ceiling, flickering lazily. A loud voice filled the room from hidden speakers. Hello Peter. Welcome to part one. You will be completely clean so we can move on to step two. It was the lady. Please undress so you can continue. I looked around and I crossed my arms. Peter, if you don't, there will be consequences, she said. I took off my clothes. Who knows what they would have done if I didn't. Good. Now you will take a very special shower with distilled water. The water will make it easy to inject said vaccine, she explained. One of the tiles moved away and a shower head popped out. The water turned on instantly. As I was a sweaty and dirty mess, I accepted the shower and I scrubbed. Not having any soap wasn't an issue. I was just happy to be clean. After about 10 minutes, the nozzle went back. I heard a loud clang and saw somebody toss a gown into the room, like the kind patients have to wear at the hospital. Good job. Now please put the gown on. Your first clothes are to be disposed of, as you will no longer need them. What does she mean, I won't need them? The guard said that I wouldn't make it out. That's pretty clear. I don't know. I shrugged on the gown and the door opened. The two guards grabbed me and walked me across the hall. They opened the door across from the shower room. Inside was a trashy waiting room. Two other boys my age sat in plastic chairs, wearing the same gown as me. The guards shut the door as they tossed me in. I looked at the two boys. Hello. One of them murmured. Hi, I replied. I guess I wouldn't be alone during whatever happened next. Or I could at least hope so. I'm Ryan and that's Sean, he said. 
I'm Peter. I replied, saying my own name. How long have you been in here? Three days, he said. Sean, well, he's been in here for months. Always refused. I don't know what they did to him, but he's pretty static. Yeah, static is the word. Sean's mouth had moved slightly. He sat unblinking, staring straight ahead. So, uh, how did they get you? He asked. What do you mean? I looked at him. How did they, you know, get you? You mean kidnap me? Yeah. He rolled his eyes. They put a sack over my head and tossed me in a car. How about you? Same, he replied. He looked down at his shoes. I took a seat at the chair across from him. A motel painting hung on the wall above my head. Sad. We all just kind of sat around for a while. Nothing really interesting happened. Unless you count Sean moving his head for the first time in 15 minutes interesting. And then it was pretty boring. I didn't complain though. It was nice to be in others' company, even if it was against my own will. I was starting to doze off when the door opened. We were all pulled up and put into a single file line. We walked down the hallways and were put into a room where three cylindrical pods sat. I knew what these were. Hopefully, it wouldn't be my coffin. Hello. Now we are on to phase two. Please insert yourself in the pods. The staff will then help you buckle up and get your masks on. Uh, it was her again. Her voice was eerily cheerful. Ryan and I got into our pods, not wanting to know what would happen if we didn't. Sean just stood there, but not for long. A woman in a polo shirt and khakis rushed in and got him into his pod. She then fastened tight straps across his waist, chest, and knees, and then did the same for me and Ryan. I looked over at Ryan and he nodded to me. I nodded back and I took a deep breath. She then fastened the tight mask over my face, pulling the straps on them tight. Air started to rush into the mask with force, and she did the same to Ryan and Sean. And then a glass roof came down over the pods. The woman ran out of the room. My heart quickened. Wait, what vaccine was this for? What if they injected us with Ebola or something even deadlier that we didn't know about? The lights in the room dimmed and three people in bio suits rushed in. A little hole opened up in the pod and a needle poked through. I cringed. Stay very still, a voice said. I need to be very precise. I felt the needle break the skin and the plunger get pushed. I winced. He pulled the needle out and he slapped a bandage on it. The hole closed. I looked at Ryan. Alright, good job. You each got different vaccines for METS B6709. That is a disease that causes extreme vomiting and skin reactions. And so if you start to feel itchy, please let us know. And do not worry about the vomit, as your mask has a vacuum feature and it will clear up anything. She said. You will receive the vaccine momentarily. Just a disclaimer. All these vaccines are still being tested. Some may have some side effects. Wait, what? I waited for a few moments when my skin started to itch. It worked fast. I kicked my foot against the glass and the man in the bio suit came in. I felt my stomach quiver and I vomited. The man quickly came over and flipped a switch on the pod. The vomit was sucked on a tube, and airflow soon resumed. Another bio suit person ran in with a case. She opened the case and pulled out a needle. The hole opened. This will hurt a bit, she said. Just stay calm and take some deep breaths. I screamed as the needle punctured the flesh. I cried and yelled for help and for it to stop. 
She pulled out the needle after a minute and slapped yet another band-aid onto the wound. The hole closed and she moved on to Ryan and Sean. After a few minutes, the itching and vomiting had stopped. I lay back against the pod. But then I hear the screaming. I look over to see Sean getting injected with the vaccine. He struggled against his constraints and he screeched. The biosuit woman couldn't get the needle in. And then Sean's skin started to stretch into grotesque, inhuman ways. He seemed to be growing very rapidly. The scream deepened and the glass broke. The constraints ripped and Sean leaped out of the pod and out of the woman. Now the woman screamed and a wet gurgling sound could be heard. Two armed guards rushed as the other biosuit guy rushed out. What was once Sean was now this thing. He was hunched over and his skin was bubbly and pale, almost looking like putty. He turned to the guards and he screamed like a banshee. The guards opened fire with their rifles and Sean nearly exploded from the bullets. The wounds ripped right through his flesh and went all over the walls. Blood splattered onto his and Ryan's pods. More guards rushed in and started shooting. Sean lay in a heap on the ground, just a pile of mush and gore. The guard opened Ryan's pod and then mine, and they usher us out. We are carried down the hall roughly and tossed into a chamber. The door slammed shut. Ryan and I are freaked the hell out. What the hell was that? He nearly yelled. I couldn't even speak. It was horrific. He... he... Ryan stopped speaking. What if that happens to us? I stopped breathing for a second and I looked over at him. Holy shit, I murmured. Moments later, biosuit people run in along with three guards. They looked at our terrified faces and one says, You did not get the same vaccine as Sean. You were fine. However, you will be tested and studied for the following weeks to see how the vaccines affect the human biome and cell reproduct. She was cut off by the sound of gunfire. The guards turn around and run down the hall, shoving the biohazard people aside. I don't know what I was thinking at that moment, but I looked at Ryan and he nodded. We got up and we ran like hell. An alarm started ringing through the building. Guards ran past us, not even looking at us. What possibly could be going on? We turned down the hall and ran into the explanation lady and four guards. Ryan and I fell to the ground. She looked down at us with a grin. Nice try, kiddos, but you don't get to leave. In fact, you are to be disposed of. My face went pale as the guards picked us up and ran us down the hall the other way. Ryan and I tried to fight back. We were brought through these two double doors and then into this giant, circular room. In the middle sat a large round pit with bubbling fluids pouring from a tube. It kind of looked like one of those things that dispense water continuously into a pool. The woman nodded at the pool of what I assume was chemicals to the guards. The guards started carrying us. Ryan and I looked at each other, and we shook our heads. I don't know how this happened, but it was a miracle. The doors burst open, and two men in combat uniforms shot the four guards down, barely missing me and Ryan. The guards fell into this pool of chemicals. Ryan and I did not see the aftermath. Unfortunately for us, Explanation Woman pulled out a pistol and shot the two guards. They went down. She sighed. Such a pity, she said. She turned to us and said to me, You first. She grabbed me by the collar and shoved me towards the tube dispenser chemicals. She pointed the gun at Ryan and said, You come near us and you die. I struggled as she pulled my head closer. I cringed. She looked at me and laughed. And then Ryan tackled her. Her head plunged into the fluid and she screamed. My eyes widened. Ryan quickly pulled back. I looked at the tube and I saw a red lever. I got up and I pulled it. The fluid stopped gushing. 
only a few drops spewed out. What was once the woman was now a burnt, rash corpse. Her whole head was hanging on by the last few tendons. The burnt and boiling skin peeled. I leaned over and I vomited. Ryan looked at the corpse wide-eyed. Holy shit. I sat down and I leaned against the wall. I shut my eyes. And then the doors banged open again. More people in combat uniforms rushed in. Heads up. Federal Bureau of Investigation. You're being detained. Said one of them. We were being rescued? Never had those words felt so good. I was returned home under a made-up story that I had been kidnapped by a local predator, completely made up. Lucky for me, I was safe and sound. Unfortunately, Ryan was sent to a mental hospital after he plunged the woman's head into the chemicals. I still try to visit him every now and then, but I can't talk to him. All he does is rant about what he calls the conquered woman. Who knows what that means? It turns out a private military contractor was hired by the three-letter agency to make bioweapons for torture, and we were there to test an anti-serum. The base was an underground facility in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains, just hours from where I live. I don't know if I'll ever be able to get over what I had seen, but I'll try my best just to forget. I was walking back from work at lunchtime, one of those coveted half days. It was the same route that I had taken hundreds of times before. I would leave my office, take the main road out of the industrial estate, and then take a shortcut through a hedge, which led to a small housing estate. And then I would duck under the metal bars put up to stop cyclists riding past, and then out into the countryside. I had always enjoyed it as soon as I hit the wilderness. It was so quiet, and in the summer, there was something majestic about walking past miles and miles of cornfields. When I got to the T-junction, my normal way was blocked by a car crash. Two cars were upended, and lay peacefully in the ruts along the side of the road, like upturned ladybugs. A police cordon had blocked off entry, and an officer helped cars turn around in the road and head back. As it was still light out, I hopped a turnstile and followed the public footpath along the side of one of the fields. From behind me, I heard the screams of a woman. I can only assume that she was a part of the crash, or knew people involved. I remembered wincing and a pang of anxiety curdled in my stomach. I had never walked through the fields before, but I roughly knew the way using the landmarks, like the church steeple I could see in the distance that was only a few blocks from my house. I saw the forest that abutted the hedgerow in front of me. I approached and I saw that there was no way through, and so I followed the footpath that led in the opposite direction to where I was headed. I continued to hear sounds of commotion from behind me, the screams now replaced with the sounds of sirens. I hope that meant an ambulance was taking away survivors. They don't use their sirens otherwise. Halfway along, I noticed a break in the hedgerow, so I pushed myself through and into the forest. A desire line from many years of use showed me the way through. A damp track trampled into the dirt where no undergrowth grew. The space dot trees got more and more dense, and less light broke through the evergreen canopy above. The track branched in front of me, leaving me with two less and noticeable path. I took out my phone and I checked Google Maps, slightly disoriented from the dense forest. I chose the right path. It was hard going. Any speed I had was now replaced by careful footsteps as I lifted my legs over berry roots and rocks, trying my best not to get my trousers dirty. 
My progress was stopped as a chain link fence came into view. Checking the map again, there didn't appear to be anything on the other side, and so I assumed it was a landowner's border. 40 yards or so along, I saw an opening. The thin metal wire had been cut and pulled back, like an incision held open by surgical clamps. I saw signs pinned to the fence at regular intervals. No text, just a logo. That of a black square with a white solid circle in the middle. I took a moment to decide if I was going to risk it. Having heard rumors from when I was at school of farmers shooting intruders on sight. It was then that my phone rang. It was my wife. Hey, I said as I answered. Where are you? I'm on my way home. There is a car crash, so I needed to take a detour. It's two o'clock already. Shit, I said, remembering the promise that I had made to her. I won't be long, I promise. Don't leave without me. You know what my mother's like. I can't guarantee that. Part of me was okay being late. I didn't get on with the in-laws that well, though the other part of me didn't want to disappoint my wife. I'll be quick. As I hung up, my body already made the decision for me, and I was under the hole in the fence before I had a chance to put my phone away. The forest soon thinned. It wasn't a natural thinning. I could see tree stumps dot the forest floor until it was almost a clearing. And then the smell hit me. A sweet odor, mixed with rot. My dad had a ball python when I was a teenager, and the sweetness reminded me of the smell of a newly defrosted mouse. And the rot reminded me of the smell that would greet me when the snake rejected the food, and I would have to remove it in the morning. I expected to see a dead deer or something similar. When the source of the order was revealed, I was not ready for it. I stumbled and I fell to the floor. I didn't see it. Grass had grown tall in the open area. Even in the winter sun, I hadn't noticed it. I had been checking too far into the distance. When I pushed myself up on my arms, it stared back at me. Two empty eye sockets and a bony smile that either said, Help me, or gave out a silent laugh. The skin on its face was bloated and a pale tan, pulled taut like a shirt three sizes too small, bursting at the seams. The arms lay peacefully at its side, along with its body and a Y incision buckling around the stitches. Frantically, I scuttled along the floor, trying to get away from it. I stopped when I felt something come into contact with my back. I jumped onto my feet with a loud scream. Looking, it was only a mound of impacted dirt, like that of a termite nest, with a large hole in the center. I couldn't remember being so scared. The last time that I had seen a dead body was before my father's funeral, and his body had been in storage so it didn't come with the rot and stench that now presented me. I scanned around and noticed more and more of the bodies, all neatly tucked away. Some shielded, mostly from view by grass, others in the open, as if they had only been recently placed. I felt my heart race in my chest. I had heard of body farms before, but I knew them to be rare. I didn't expect to stumble across one in my own backyard. In my adrenaline so tight, I took out my phone and I began filming. I knew my friend Josh wouldn't believe me when I told him, and so I wanted evidence. I was surprised with how calm I was walking around, holding the phone out in front of me. It was reminiscent of when we both stayed at Chillingham Castle for the night. I was a nervous wreck but with a night vision camera, something changed in me. I guess that's how journalists cope in war zones. I walked further into the, for want of a better word, farm. 
I filmed 12 bodies in total. All were in different states of decay. Next to them were little white posts with numbers on them. It was horrific. I didn't stare. Instead, I followed the phone, making sure I had enough footage for Josh. In the distance, I heard the lo-fi sounds of radio, maybe walkie-talkie. I didn't stop filming. I just ran. Ran back from where I came from. I slid under the brick in the fence and back out into the field. It was only when I put the phone back into my pocket that I saw how dirty I was. My shoes and trousers were caked in mud, and I hope that's all it was. By the time I had made it back to the T-junction, the road home was open. The cars were still lying motionless in the ditches, though an officer directed traffic down the one open lane, taking turns to let out direction. I waited until he ushered me through. As I was walking along the line of cars I waited, I felt my phone vibrate. It was the text from my wife. We are leaving without you. I took a photo of my legs and shoes and I sent it back. I had an accident, I replied. She rang me back. What happened? She said. I could hear the sounds of traffic in the background. Well, the shortcut I took didn't really work out. You're telling me. Wait, are you sure you didn't do that so you didn't have to spend time with my parents? I heard mumbles from my in-laws in the background. Well, show them the photo then. My legs were heavy by the time that I arrived home. I don't run, so the little that I did, I could feel. I showered and changed, secretly glad that I had the afternoon for myself. The first thing I did after that was to send the video to Josh, with a message of, You won't believe what I just saw. I waited a couple of minutes for him to reply, knowing that he was probably at work himself. When a reply didn't come, I booted up my laptop, opened an incognito browser window, and searched for body farms. It was 4 o'clock when Josh phoned me. I was waiting for you to phone. Did you catch the video? I did, he said, and his voice was somber. What did you think? I said excitedly. I'm speechless, he replied. How are you not more scared? It's only dead bodies. Yeah, I freaked out when I saw the first one. But they can't hurt you, can they? Have you watched it back? He said. I heard his voice become more and more breathless. Why? I'm coming over. He said. Get that on your laptop. Are you running or something? Yes, I am. I can pick you up when Susan's back. She's out with her parents. What's so interesting that I need to watch it again? That first body, he said. I could hear that he was running now. At the end, at the end of the video, it's gone. What? I sat in front of my laptop at the dining table, looking out of the front window, waiting to see Josh come up the driveway. The video was ready for me to play, but I couldn't bring myself to watch it on my own. My hand shook anxiously as I held it over the touchpad. It's only a video, I said to myself, of you and what happened when you were there. Another part of me said. Moments later, Josh walked up the driveway, panting as if he had finished a marathon, and to be fair, he must have run a few miles. As I answered the door, I wasn't sure if I was happy. He had run so far for this, it filled me with dread. His face was that of pure fright. I expected it to be red from exertion, but instead, a ghostly pallor greeted me. I had known Josh since we were kids. I stood by him when he became addicted to heroin. 
There were times when I didn't think he would pull through. He had turned his life around. It was an incredible change. Though something stayed with him. An impulsivity. An addiction to risk. Have you watched it? He asked. Not yet. I was waiting for you. Fucking hell, man. Do it now. Can I get you a drink? Are you trying to stall? No, I replied. But I was. Josh rounded the table and pressed play. The first thing I noticed was my nasally breath that hollered through the audio. Watching it again brought back that feeling of anxiety. My hands went cold and sweaty. It's coming up, he said, sitting in the chair in front of it. He paused the video. Look, it's gone, he said, pointed to the patch on the ground. How can you be sure? He rewound the video, like he had already watched it a hundred times. You see? That's where the body is. You can see those three flowers there. Now watch. He skipped forward. There, the three flowers, but no body. A tingle traveled down my spine and caused me to shiver. He was right. I watched as Josh jumped backwards and forwards in the video. What the hell is that? He said, pausing the footage again. It was a freeze frame of me, turning to point the phone in the direction that I heard the radios. A long yellow tendril-like thing spanned the frame. He moved forward another frame, and the tendril appeared to be wrapped around something large, like a body. The next frame, the camera was pointed towards the fence, and on the left side of the screen, the lower half of what could be considered blurry legs and feet. There, he said, pointing to the smudge. That could be anything, I said. It's the same yellow thing. It picked up the body. I don't see it, I replied, not wanting to believe what it was. He moved it back a frame. How can you not see it? He pointed to the yellow tendril. He proceeded to hop between the two frames, and the more that he did it, the more I saw the narrative that he was painting. We have to go back there. You know how to get there, right? I'm not going back. If that's what you think it is, that would be crazy. I'm getting myself a drink. Do you want anything? Josh didn't respond. He was now watching an earlier part of the video. I didn't drink in the daytime. I rarely drank. I poured myself a whiskey and I drank it neat. What's that? He said from the other room. I poured myself another and I downed that too. When I returned, the footage was paused. What do you think that is? A termite nest? Nah, they're at least a few feet tall. Wait a minute. He skipped forward in the footage to where the yellow tendril spanned the screen and edged back. And I saw it. I fell against that, I said. Holy shit, I fell on that. On the screen, a blurry image burned into my eyes. What I thought was a termite nest was there, very blurred, and out of the hole was a blob of yellow. That's where it came from, Josh said excitedly. I can't deal with this, I replied and I returned to the kitchen and picked up the whiskey bottle. It wasn't the fright of what had happened. It was the what if. I had been inches away from that thing when I fell. If I had stayed any longer, I could have ended up in there. My phone vibrated. I picked it up, feeling the warming alcohol begin to take effect. It was a photo of my wife with her parents, sitting and eating sandwiches at the garden center, and a message. I really wished you were here. It was at that point that I wished that I had gotten home on time, and I was there with her, and not watching footage of a near-death experience with Josh. I replied, Me too, really, I do. 
she sent back a frowny face emoji and said that they wouldn't be too much longer. I know what the numbers are. I heard Josh shout from the dining room. What? I said returning. The numbers on the signs. They're distances. Look, this one says 10M. That one says 23M. And the one... He paused as he rewound. Next to the body that disappeared, it says 5M. They're working out how far it reaches. I stared at Josh at how he was able to deal with this as some sort of puzzle. Every extra piece of information scared me further. But to him, he was getting more excited. My wife is going to be back soon. What are you saying? We need to wrap this up. I don't want her to know what happened. You're kidding, he said. His face no longer ghost white, but bright red with adrenaline. I'm serious, man. You need to show me how to get in there. I opened my phone and I showed him on Google Maps. That doesn't help. I don't know this area. My wife's going to be back soon. Then we better hurry, he said, standing up and anxiously dancing from one foot to the other. I'm not going back there. I don't need you to. Just show me where it is. I had never seen him like this before. The determination on his face scared me. The traffic had cleared from earlier. All that remained of the accident was some police tape around the areas of where the two cars had crashed. On the ground still lay markers. The sun had set a while ago and I shone the torch onto the hedgerows, looking for the turnstile. Over there, I pointed and Josh ran ahead, vaulting over. Don't go too far, I don't want to lose you, I said trying to keep up. He relented but I could see his excitement grow. Where next? He said when we stopped at the edge of the field. This way, I said and we hurried along the hedgerow until I saw the break. What were you thinking coming this way? He said as we climbed through. I was trying to get home. I didn't expect to find what I did. We moved through the forest. It felt all the more foreboding as the light had died. We turned right at the splits and to the fence. The hole had been repaired, but badly. Is it over the other side of this fence? Shit. They know I was here. That's fine, Josh said, already twisting the ties of metal to remove the repairs. Shit. Shh, I said. They'll know we're here. Sorry, the freaking end caught me. But he didn't care. He continued like a man determined. In moments, a new hole was revealing itself. I'm not going with you, you know that. That's fine, but I'm going. What if something happens to you? I'll share my position. He opened up his phone and he began typing. I can't let you do it. Dude, you know me more than anyone. I'm going in there. I don't care what happens to me. I can't. He put his hand on my shoulder. I need to. Please let me. If this is the last thing that I do, I will die happy. Please. But he was already under the fence and walking away. I waited for a few minutes until I felt as if I was being watched. I gave an involuntary shiver and I dragged along the tracks and back to the field. My phone buzzed. It was a photo from Josh that of a body he had found. With the text... 23M. Be careful, I replied. I stared at my phone as I made the final stretch to the house, and the phone vibrated again. Where are you? It was my wife. Two sex, I replied. And moments later, I was back at the house. I grinned and I agreed to my in-laws. My wife took me to one side. Where were you? I was helping Josh, I said and her face changed. Josh, 
she feigned injecting into her arm and cocked her head back. That Josh? Yeah. I don't like it when you spend time with him. He's harmless, but he's also an old friend. She sighed. You need to spend some time with my parents. I said I would and we did. I talked to her dad about football and tried to make conversation with her mom about her flower arranging. I can't believe people have that as a hobby. Even she failed to keep her own interest as she spoke. Do you have any alcohol? My father-in-law asked. Yeah, I said, showing him into the kitchen. He spied the bottle of whiskey sitting on the sideboard. I don't usually drink in the day, but today has been a bit of a trial, I admitted. I poured him a glass. How's the job? I asked. It's been quite busy, actually. Thanks for the drink. What's been going on? I'm not sure. A lot of military movements in the area. Oh, yeah? I said nervously. It's a need-to-know basis. You know what I mean. I nodded. It's strange. I think they may be planning some more war games over in Salisbury Plain. I've had to arrange the encampment of a lot of U.S. troops. And that's not normal? A little. Not this many, though. So yeah, very busy. How are you? Not too bad. I saw the photo. How the hell did you end up covered in mud? I tried to take a shortcut, but it didn't work out. He laughed. I noticed his hair was newly cut short. I like the haircut, I said. Oh, thanks, he replied, running his hand through it. We can have any we like, as long as it's neat and short. He laughed and I reciprocated. I smiled, feeling my phone in my pocket vibrate. Well, best be getting back to the party, and listen to my wife talk about her freaking flowers. He raised his eyebrows and laughed. I pulled on my phone to see three missed messages and a voicemail. In the time that I had spent with my wife's parents, I had completely forgotten about Josh. Oh shit, I found it, was the first message, accompanied by a photo of a body and a sign, 10M, and then another with a photo of an 8M sign, the last with the three flowers and the 5M sign, in the grass lit by his phone. I could see the outline that was highlighted by the liquid that had seeped from the body. I called my voicemail and I listened. Oh shit, shit, it got me, hell, it got me. I heard maniacal laughs from Josh. Hell, it's so big. Those tentacles, there's tons of them all reaching out in different directions. I have no idea how massive this thing is. I'll send you a photo if I can. It's watching me. I think it understands me. Hello, you big yellow asshole. If you're going to kill me, do it now. The message trailed off with more laughing. Moments later, a photo arrived. I couldn't make it out, just a yellow blur. I phoned him back, feeling my heart race in my chest. It rang and rang. Aren't you going to join us? My wife asked, peeking her head around the kitchen door. Just a minute, I replied. Is that Josh you're talking to? Give me a minute, I shouted. But Josh didn't pick up. For the rest of the evening, I was distracted, checking Josh's position on Google Maps. It didn't move. I saw his pen sat in the middle of the field. What's wrong with you? My wife asked as we got ready for bed. What? It was like you were somewhere else tonight. I'm sorry, I didn't have a good day. That's Josh's fault, I know that. You cannot let him go, can you? You'd be better off without him. As she said this, I was checking his position. It had moved. On the map, I saw the pin set on top of a building called Little Park Farm. I wanted to call him again, but I didn't. No, it's not that. It's work. 
Oh, she said as she got into bed and turned over. It took me a while to get off to sleep and when I did, I had visions of yellow tendrils and dead bodies, a corrupted version of the events of the day. When I did wake, I checked Google Maps and all I saw was Josh's last known position. When I called him, it went straight to voicemail. I walked to work that morning and saw the remnants of the crash, except the police tape was replaced by a wire fence. I didn't think much of it until I saw the sign pinned to the fence, black square with a white solid circle in the middle. It wasn't until I ducked under the metal bars on the way to the housing estate that I twigged. I was about to call Josh again, but didn't. I was in denial. I didn't want to know. And if I didn't, I could pretend that he was fine. My wife phoned me when I was at work to tell me that her dad had been called away for training exercises in Salisbury and he wouldn't be around for dinner. She asked if I could pick up her mother when I got back. I sighed, knowing that I would need to get back home and then take the car. I wanted to tell her to do it herself, but I stopped myself. When I walked home, a man in army fatigues and a rifle stood next to the fencing where the car crash was. What's going on? I asked. Move along, sir, he said, and I did. A few military vehicles passed me on the way home. It wasn't unusual, but many more than I had come to expect. I didn't go inside when I returned home. I got straight in the car and drove. I went through the center of town and got stuck in traffic. I was sat there for 20 minutes until I realized that we were being turned away. When I got to the front, I saw a man ushering people to turn around. I opened the window and I asked what was going on. Military exercise, he said. Please turn around. Is this anything to do with what's going on at Salisbury? I asked, thinking of my father-in-law. Please turn around. As I did, I saw the cordon around the marketplace, and something caught my eye. Something that might look like a termite nest, though much shorter. In front of it, a wire fence, on it a pin sign. A black square with a white solid circle in the middle. What does that sign mean? I asked the man. He picked up his gun, pointed it to my mouth and said, Please, turn around. I told my wife that I couldn't pick her mother up. I sat in the dining room, checking Google Maps to see if Josh's position would update. His pin was grayed out. My wife asked what I wanted for dinner. I told her whatever she had planned was fine. I kept refreshing, pleading with it to update, not caring about anything else. An hour later, the pin disappeared. I zoomed out, expecting to see it elsewhere. I assumed that it had timed out. Lasagna, it's my mom's favorite, she said. And we ate in silence. That was good, I said as I finished. I checked my phone one last time, and to my surprise, his pin was back, though no longer where it was before. I zoomed in on it. The Nevada desert in the southwestern United States. And as quickly as it appeared, it disappeared and it didn't come back. Over the last few days, I've noticed the symbol appearing in more and more places, and the military personnel are popping up all over the place. I've told my wife about them, but she says her dad says there's nothing to worry about. But I am. One of those termite nests had appeared in our backyard. My wife asked me to get rid of it, but I don't want to go near it. You may be thinking that the movies make it look easy. Oh, well all you gotta do is put a bullet of silver in its skull. That's not too hard, right? Wrong. A cryptid is at least six times smarter than any human. 
If I could kill humans instead, I would complete twice as many jobs. There are more risks involved than people take into account. You fail and dozens of others die. You succeed and you get your 60 bucks per cryptid. I started this thread to document my experiences in the field. I don't know how long it'll carry it on. It depends how long people listen. It's just gonna kinda be a public journal. Anyways, I'm rambling. I'm Kyle and I kill things that go bump in the night. Night 1 at 6 p.m., I get into my Midnight Black 2010 Ford F-350. The cast iron spiked bumper guard glistening in the evening sun. She's my pride and joy. Name's Stacy. She keeps me company on my trips. That and 101.5. I begin my patrol, waiting for the call from my boss, Jerry. A 6'9 redhead who's more jacked than Mike Tyson on steroids. About my night's assignment. He finally calls me around 8.30. Jerry's deep gravelly voice relays the information that I'm on the hunt for a Staggeron. It's basically a big buck that is 6 feet tall. If that deer had the organic equivalent of cast iron for fur and horns sharper than that of butcher knives... Also said, it is not afraid of humans, and will not hesitate to gore them to death. And add carnivorous on top of that and you have a staggeron. I personally like to call them stags. All in all, a fairly simple hunt to open this log. I went to the area of the sighting and I parked Stacy. I opened the back door of my truck, grabbed my AR-10 Chamberton 308. All in all, effectual due to the fact that they were lead bullets, and my 500 Magnum revolver. I put one very expensive bullet that vibrated between my fingers in the cylinder. A silver bullet. I put the revolver in my holster, and started the search for the gory sight. According to Jerry, a young couple was walking on the side of the road when a huge white mass came charging out and collided with the male. He was killed on impact. The female ran and called the police bawling about the loss of her boyfriend. They referred her to Jerry who then contacted me. She then witnessed the stag spear her boyfriend's corpse and walk into the woods with it impaled on its horns. I found bloodstains in the road and I followed them into the woods. After about half an hour of trailing it, it was starting to get dark. I switched on the light at the end of my gun. By the light from my tack light, I found the sickening sight. There would be no open casket funeral for this man. There wasn't much left of him. The steg had ripped his stomach open, leaving his entrails trailing everywhere. His chest was nothing but lungs and ribs. Stegs think of hearts as a delectable morsel and the steg was now working on eating the man's face. I needed a clean shot to the head with my revolver to kill it. The only thing I was going to do with the rifle would be piss it off. And plus, even if I had managed to penetrate his skin, cryptids have advanced regeneration. In a matter of minutes, it would be fully healed. However, bronze burns cryptids. It had not yet noticed me, I switched off my tack light and I waited for my eyes to adjust. I pulled the roll of bronze wire I always kept on me out of my pocket and unrolled some. With the silence of a trained assassin. Which I am, but that's a story for another time. Was when I thought of something. I'm a big guy, 6'5 and about 200 pounds of pure muscle. But I couldn't possibly keep this thing under control until it was tired enough to shoot it. Unless it was in severe pain beforehand. The stag's genitals were openly exposed. I took my chance and I brought my steel-toed area boots into its nuts as hard as I could. The stag brayed in pain as its baby-making sack was hit with enough pressure to smash a cinder block. 
and I jumped on its back and I wrapped the wire around the stag's neck and I pulled. I heard the sizzle of its skin burning and it started to balk. The only thing I could think was, shit, how did it recover so fast? I hung on for dear life, as I knew if I was bucked off those horns, they were going to stab me right through the lungs. And then I got another idea that was probably dumber than the first. I grabbed its horns and I jumped. It was getting more pissed off by the minute, and even more so that it had resistance on its horns. I got traction and I held my footing. I twisted its head and the stag dropped, flopping like a fish out of water. You see, when the stag is twisted, it loses all power to its muscles. I placed my foot on its neck, pulled out the revolver, took aim at its head, and I pulled the trigger. The shot rang out and the stag stopped thrashing. I called Jerry, told him that the job was done. He sent a cleanup crew to take care of the bodies, both human and stag. I waited on Stacy's tailgate until they got there. Once they did, I exchanged words with Jerry who accompanied them. The money was wired to my account and I put my equipment back in my truck and drove off, only slightly more sore than when I started. I got home, locked my truck and went inside and here I am. Type in a journal of my tale of the night on Reddit. That's all the time I have for now. I'll be back soon. This is Kyle Reidinger signing off. Hey again. And tonight I had an extremely difficult and, well, god it was painful. Currently my ass feels like I dropped the soap in prison. My arm is wrapped in hospital gauze due to the bite that I received. And I'm more purple than Thanos. I'm Kyle Renninger and I get the shit beat out of me by hairless dogs apparently. Night 2 I got into my truck, completely dreading tonight's hunt. I had dealt with Native American creatures before and shit they hurt. I however had never dealt with this specific creature. Jerry called me around 5. Yo, I said as I picked up the phone. Kyle, your assignment is a keylet. It's been terrorizing the cars driving on 522. What the hell is a keylet? Hang on, let me pull up the file. A few clicks later. A beast of Native American origin, known to fry the brain of any human that looks in its eyes, confusing it long enough to strike. It has an appearance like that of a hairless coyote, save for the fur on its feet which helps it move silently. It sounds like something straight from hell. He hung up the phone a second after that and now I was on my way through the state of West Virginia to a little town in the middle of nowhere known as Berkeley Springs. Think the smallest hick town you know and shrink it by a factor of four. That's Berkeley Springs. I arrived in town and I went to a small gas station asking about anybody seeing a hairless coyote. Apparently a car had rolled through about an hour before. The tire popped, scratches down the side and a smashed window. I asked to see the car as it had been left there. The 2019 Dodge Challenger looked like it had been hit by a steamroller with claws. The windshield was smashed. There were two inch deep claw marks running down the side, shredding the metal and chipping the black paint. The tire looked like it had been run through a sickle bar mower. And the car's roof had been ripped off, turning it into a convertible, redneck style. Whatever this keylet was, it was a bad mother trucker, and I wasn't sure I wanted to fight it. I asked the owner of the store where the car owner had had his encounter, if you can call it that. He told me that it was about a mile outside of town. I opened up the back of my truck and I started loading my guns. I put a magazine of bronze rounds into my AR and one single bullet into my revolver. This round was different from what I normally used. If the beast is Native American, you have to use a special round. The bullets are silver hollow points with holy ash in the tip, 
and blessed by a Native American shaman. I got in the truck and I started driving down 522. After about 5 minutes, I heard a growl that rattled the frame of my truck and I saw golden eyes in the woods alongside the road. Next thing I knew, my truck was rattling with each revolution of my tire. I stopped the truck and I got out. I looked at my passenger side tire and saw a hairless coyote clamped on my steel reinforced tire. It snarled and released it when it saw me. This thing was five foot tall with wrinkled pink skin and midnight black fur around its feet. It bared huge sharp teeth at me as I started to back up and it followed. I aimed my assault rifle at its eyes and fired. It yelled in pain as my bullet hit it in the eye leaving a sizzling hole. You see, cryptids couldn't regenerate complete new body parts, such as eyes so it would be blind in that eye forever. It started to run at me and I kicked it in the head. It went sprawling with another yelp. However, it was back up in half a second and running at me again. I'm not proud of it but I panicked in the moment. I started to run away when this thing jumped on me and bit me in the ass. I flipped over and I trapped it beneath me, but it scratched the hell out of my back trying to get out. I got up and I ran to put distance between us. It was back up in a second and running at me. It caught up and it latched onto my arm. I screamed in pain which only made it bite harder. I took my bowie knife, the size of a small crusader sword, out and I stabbed it in its side. It yelped again and let go, but it regenerated around my knife so I wouldn't be able to get it back out. Before I knew what was happening, the keylet jumped on me. I held it back as best I could because it was trying to snap my throat. I knew if it got to my throat, I was gone. I started frantically punching it in the face, neck, and body. Eventually, I kicked it off and I ran to Stacy. I started her up and drove her full speed into the keylet, impaling it on the cast iron spikes welded to my bumper guard. It thrashed and screamed and sprayed blood across the front of my truck and the ground. I pulled out my revolver, doing my best to minimize use of my left arm, and aimed at the keylet's head and fired. It died immediately. I got back in my truck, slumped into the driver's seat and called Jerry, telling him that the keylet was dead. While I was waiting for the cleanup crew, I did my best to staunch the bleeding to my arm to no result. The keylet had severed an artery. I ripped off my shirt sleeve and wrapped it tightly around the bite. That would have to do until I got to the hospital. Jerry got there with the crew, took the body and wired 750 to my account. Damn well deserved too after the shit that thing put me through. And I drove to the hospital. I told the doctor in the hospital that I got attacked by a rabid dog, which isn't entirely untrue. I went home and here I am again writing this post. I'm gonna take some time off to let my wounds heal. I'll be back after that. Don't play with Keyleth's kids. This is Kyle Reininger, signing off. Night 3 Jerry called me with my assignment for the night. A naiad and Jobbins. Now I know how to deal with Jobbins, but I had never had to do so. Basically, they're like big fireflies. They grow red and create a melodic song by moving their wings. This song can put a human to sleep, or if they're already asleep, it can keep them from waking. From what I can tell, they're fairly peaceful. The way to get rid of them is to make their presence seem unwanted. I just didn't quite know how to do this. A naiad is a water nymph that lures people into the water with their beauty, and then they drown them. I had dealt with them first. The house was about half an hour outside of Berkeley Springs. That place like attracts cryptids. On the way there, I realized that I haven't really told you guys much about me. So let me introduce myself. My name is Kyle Redinger. I'm a 6'5", 200 pound lump of pure muscle. 
I have jet black hair, a standard army crew cut, and an unkempt lumberjack beard. My typical attire includes a bootcut jeans, a plain black tight t-shirt, my steel-toed area boots, and a camel baseball cap. I grew up in rural West Virginia, between Berkeley Springs and Martinsburg. My dad was a raging alcoholic who took his anger out on me. My mother was submissive and didn't stand up to my father. My little sister Becca is the nicest person you'll ever meet. I killed my dad when I was 17. I came home from work one night to hear her screaming. My mom was at work as well. I ran up the stairs and burst into her room to see my dad on top of her. I kept a gun since I worked at a gun shop and I used it in defense. I grabbed him, threw him to the floor and didn't hesitate to shoot him in the dick. As he lay on the floor screaming, I got Becca out. I grabbed him again and slammed him against the window over and over until it shattered. I shoved him out and I watched him tumble off the porch roof onto the ground. I ran down the stairs and outside to see him trying to get up and I shot him. Again and again until my gun was out of ammo. He was dead by the third shot. I buried him in the backyard. My mother came home and I told her what had happened. No one ever suspected his disappearance related to his death. They all thought that he ran off with another woman. After that, I graduated high school and I used my psychology degree in an unusual way. I started a business as a contract killer. Something snapped at me the day I killed my father. Some piece of my sanity was just gone. Not only was I now willing to kill, but, well, I looked forward to it. I enjoyed it. But don't mistake me as a serial killer, oh no. I do it for cash. You may be wondering why I'm willing to confess to these crimes. Crimes that I would be executed for. Well, for one, I'm no longer afraid of death. I no longer really feel fear. I feel pain and defeat, yes, but not fear. And number two, the entire world thinks that I'm dead. Shot and a hit gone wrong. Well, I was shot, but I recovered just fine. The body they found that had my photo less ID was in fact planted on a Mr. George Mason. My accomplice, who when I was shot, I shot in the back of the head and pitched his body over the side of the building before fleeing the scene. That's when Jerry found me. I was hiding out at my late grandmother's house when I heard a knock at the door. I was just getting hot with a girl I brought home from the local bar so obviously, this knock on the door at 1am pissed me off a bit. I didn't bother putting my pants back on before I walked to the door leaving a very noticeable bulge in my boxers. I opened the door to see that 6'9 redhead with a lumberjack beard and biceps bigger than a bottle of Jack in my hand. Who the hell are you? I asked. Name's Jerry. I understand you're a hitman on the run. At this statement, I knew he was going to try and get money from me or threaten to tell. So I smashed the bottle of Jack Daniels on his head swung up onto his back and I put him in a chokehold. He promptly plucked me off his back with one hand and hurled me through the drywall. I hope that's not the tactic you use when I hire you. I didn't like that he didn't say if in the statement. It was like he was implying that I was going to go work for him or else. What do you mean hire me? I mean that from now on. You're going to be hunting monsters. He flicked a business card in my face and walked towards the door. The card said, Crypt X Monster Extermination Services, Jerry Wikes, and then his phone number. Hold the phone, Jim or Jerry, or jerk off, or whatever the hell your name is. What if I don't want to hunt monsters since they don't exist? Oh, you want proof of their existence? Here. He disappeared for a moment and came back with a freaking six foot tall wolf. It leapt out of me and started to drag me out the door by my shirt. After my screaming, Jerry then said, Ragmire, that's enough. 
What the hell is that thing? That would be a fern wolf. And as to your question, if you don't want to, then you die. Simple as that. How much? The $60 minimum. It goes up depending on the cryptid. Fine, I'll attend the training. Great, see you there. After this, me and my date finished what we were doing. Three times over and I sent her home the next morning. And now here I am. After a week of training, I'm now a cryptid hunter of two months. I arrived at the property with the Nayad problem. The property was big. Probably about 100 acres based on what Stacy's GPS said. I turned off the song that I was listening to. Indestructible by Disturbed. And I got out of the truck. The owner of the property walked up to me. Pond's over there. He said in a gruff voice. He was middle aged, balding and had a beer belly. He was fairly short with a no-nonsense face. I grabbed a silver spear out of my truck after thanking the man and watching him walk back inside. I walked over to the pond and I looked in. I couldn't see anything at first, but then I noticed the face. It was the same as a human's, but it was green. I held up the spear and I spoke in a commanding voice. Come out of the pond now or I swear I'll stab you in the head. She looked up at me and didn't move, as if calling my bluff. I wasn't bluffing. A second later, she was wailing in an ear-splitting tone and writhing under the water. A few more seconds and she was floating, dead. She literally just looked like a human with a fishtail. I called Jerry and I left the property. Next side of the call about the job ends. I arrived at the spot on 522 near to where I killed the keylet at around 10 p.m. I immediately saw the red glow and I heard their melodic song. To make them feel unwanted, I grabbed my revolver and shot it in their general direction. They flew off and I got back into Stacy. I started to head home when I saw something that definitely wasn't human run in front of my truck. I pulled out my revolver with one of my nat rounds and I got out of the truck. I began to search. After a while of walking down the road, I found a little old lady hunched over in the middle of the highway. I knew exactly what this was when I saw the wood skin on her back. Skinwalker. Shit. She turned around and as soon as I met her eyes, I passed out. I woke up a few seconds later with her on top of me now. A wolf-like creature, only it was so distorted that it looked more like a demon. I moved extremely quickly and put all my weight behind my foot which connected with its abdomen and sent it flying. I ran up to it and I kicked it in the face. Only it caught my shoe and it drug me off my feet. It turned back to human and this thing kicked me in the face. She then punched me in the dick. What the hell? I said. Make wise your words, son. She said in a voice far too deep for a little old lady. Screw off. She kicked me in the mouth and I started to stand up. She grabbed the knife in my belt and cut me across the abdomen, knocked me down and held the knife against my throat. I was dead. I knew it. She knew it. But for some reason I survived. She got up, putting my knife back in my belt, punched me in the throat to keep me down, and ran off into the woods yelling, Next time, I won't be so merciful. After I recovered my composure, I got up. I tried to track her, but it was useless. There were no tracks in the mud, no bloodstains, nothing. I checked the cut on my chest. It was deep, but I wouldn't need stitches. I called Jerry and told him what had happened, and that there was a skinwalker at large. He responded with a, Kyle, you freaking idiot. And I went home to lick my wounds. So, uh, my call was a little different tonight. First of all, Jerry said that I now had a partner. His name is Javier, 
He can explain his backstory. He'll be there in 10 minutes. Hang on, Jer. You know I work alone. Uh, I don't do partners. You do now. Fine. What's my assignment? You have two again tonight. First, there is a herd of Wendigo hunting tourists around the Winchester, Virginia area. Second, well, this is an unusual one. Jerry chuckled. Um, a sex robot went rampant. It killed its owner by strangling it between its legs during a 69 maneuver. It was last spotted around the Sharpsburg area in Maryland. Jerry, you do realize I work in cryptid interventions. Not killing sex workers, right? Hey, whatever it takes to make money, right? I guess. Wait for Javier to set out. Copy that. Javier arrived about five minutes later. A 2019 Dodge Ram 3500 Turbo Diesel painted cherry red rolled into my driveway. A rich boy. This guy clearly had no idea what he needed to hunt cryptids. The truck was fully stock. No reinforced windows, no cast iron bumper, no iron laced tires, nothing. That truck was like a soda can to any cryptid. A man in his early 20s stepped out of the truck. He was about 6 foot even, probably 170 pounds with a mullet, a thick mustache and a Glock 17 on his head. He was wearing a pair of black jeans and a white t-shirt, and a pair of Carolina boots. He had a pair of Oakley sunglasses covering his eyes. You must be Kyle, he said while approaching me. Yeah, and you must be Javier, I replied. The one and only. This your truck? I asked, pointing to it. Yeah, you like her? Oh yeah, I love her. But we're gonna take my truck if you don't want it smashed like a beer can. You might want to get it kitted, similar to mine. I pointed to Stacy, dense in the side. A broken headlight and dried blood in the bumper spikes from the keylet made her look much more able for the job than the pretty boy's truck. Fine, let's take the piece of shit. At this, I got up and I punched him in the gut. He got up and went for his gun, but I had mine off my hip first and at the sound of the hammer cock back, for dramatic effect, he raised his hands. Don't make fun of another man's truck, Javier. He gave me a shitty and grin and laughed, and so did I. I helped him up and we got into Stacy and we started her. So, Javier, what do you want to see first? A rampant sex robot or a herd of Wendigo? He looks taken aback. A uh, robot, please. I'm not too fond of Wendigo. Robot it is. After driving for a few minutes, I worked up the courage to ask Javier about his past. So, what's your story? Well, I used to be a cartel leader for El Chapo. And then my partner betrayed me. She reported me to the police and she took our kids. She killed our son and sold our daughter into trafficking. I hunted her down. I posed as a Bolivian ambassador and got her into bed without her recognizing me. I threw her out of the window and I jumped out after her, put her in my cartel car then I drove away. I took care of her a few minutes later in the middle of the desert and I left her to rot. Did you ever find your daughter? Yeah, she was bought by a few FBI agents who had the goal of freeing as many trafficking victims as possible. They freed her back into my custody until they found out about my past. They took her away and they imprisoned me. I broke out by strangling the guard on duty with my handcuff. I shot and killed everybody in the compound including my twin brother, who had been imprisoned for cartel affiliation. I placed my ID in his pocket and I ran. Holy shit, you're a badass man. How did they not realize that the body wasn't yours? The cartel requires members to burn off their finger and toe print so they can't be identified if imprisoned. So your ex-partner, she was your girlfriend. No amigo, 
She was my wife. I will never understand why she killed her son. I don't think I want to look into somebody that insane. Holy crap, man. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It doesn't bother me as much anymore. Enough about me. What's your backstory, compadre? I outlined to him the story of my past, which I told all of in my previous post, along with some details that I left out, which I would like to continue to leave out for now as they involve my child. I may tell you someday. Wow. So this cryptex really does just take in criminals like us. Javier said when I was finished. We arrived in the Sharpsburg area a short while later. It wasn't hard to find the robot. It didn't go far from her previous residence. I pulled out my revolver, lead bullets this time, and held it at the ready. Put your hands up, ma'am. She turned around. Why? I accidentally killed my owner. Everybody thinks I did it on purpose. What reason do I have to live? Shoot me, sir. Please. We aren't going to shoot you, ma'am. Please, put your hands up. How this thing was sentient with feeling of regret, I had no clue. But I was willing to bring her in, or kill her, either one. Fine. She slowly raised her hands. I handcuffed her. Valerie of Sexto Corp. You're under arrest for the murder of Jonathan Rogers. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you by the state of Maryland. Do you have any questions? No. Good. I just arrested a sex robot. I called the police and left her chained to the front porch and we left. Two criminals have no business in an arrest. We began driving to Winchester, and shortly enough we arrived at the location, and met a park ranger who took us to the location of the disappearance. I knew exactly where the Wendigo lair was from the stench of rot coming from the cave about 100 yards away from the disappearance site. I told the park ranger to wait where he was, which he gladly did and Javier and I went in. The cave wasn't very deep. When we got to the back of it, there were four Wendigo feasting on seven bodies, all clearly campers. I had a full cylinder of nat rounds, six shots. Javier had his magazine full of nat rounds. His finger fondled the trigger of his Glock. The gun was clearly comfortable in his hands. I tried not to think about how many people had died at the hands of this man. I was no clean slave, but he has killed at least 100 more people than I. And it scared me. We opened fire on the Wendigo herd. My first bullet caught the Alpha in the head, killing him instantly. Javier's caught one in the genitals. It bellowed in pain. My second bullet caught another one in the chest, blowing a hole the size of a potato through it. Javier had a sadistic grin on his face while shooting to wound. He was clearly enjoying their pain. He had shot the same one three times now, in the lower body. I shot the third one after it started to run at us. It died immediately. I had hit it in the head as well. Javier was still shooting the same Wendigo, torturing it. I shot it in the head. Javier, why the hell weren't you shooting to kill? These things deserve pain and you know what, Kyle. Shoot to kill next time. Yes, sir. I called Jerry and he sent the cleanup crew. I had 500 wired to my account and Javier had 450 to his. We went home. Javier got into his truck and drove home after a quick goodbye. Okay, so a lot of shit has happened since the last update. First off, I should clarify that I'm not Kyle. I'm Javier Garcia. And right now, there is an open investigation into Kyle Reitinger's disappearance. When I got here, I found a story nearly finished on his laptop. I hid it and I called the cops because Kyle was nowhere to be found in his house. 
There was blood on the floor trailing to the woods. His truck was still parked in his driveway. The cops arrived and I told them who was missing. And they didn't believe me at first. They didn't believe that my partner was missing. Well, that can't be possible. Kyle Redinger is dead. Bullshit he is. I told them the story Kyle told all of you in his third post. And they actually believed me by some miracle and started an investigation. I used the identity of my other twin. Identical triplets. Juan was the only one who stayed out of the cartel. They questioned me about the last time that I had seen him, and I told them. It was the night before, after our hunt. What do you mean hunt? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Tell me, son. This is important if we are to find Kyle. We need to know who he could have pissed off because right now, it looks like a kidnapping. We were on a hunt for a Sasquatch and a Fern Wolf. Son, I need you to tell the truth here. Those are just old legends. I told you you wouldn't believe me. Let me call my boss and put him on speaker. Okay. I took out my cell phone and I tapped Jerry's number in my contacts. Good old Jerry the jerk off answered on the first ring. Jay, what is it? Where the hell has Kyle been? I've been trying to call him for the past two hours. The detective answered for me. Sir, Jay is sitting with me in the police station. I am Detective Ventura of the Winchester Police Department. Kyle Reitinger went missing sometime last night and we are currently trying to find him. I understand that you are Jay's boss. There was silence for a second before. Yes. Good. Sir Jay tells me he and Kyle were hunting a Sasquatch in a fern wolf last night. Is that correct? Yes. Jerry said through obviously gritted teeth. After a few seconds, I hung up the phone. They questioned me for another half an hour then they let me go. I went home with Kyle's laptop and I'm not going to transcribe what he wrote. Tonight we had two very difficult hunts. Since we last spoke, a wolf has bit the shit out of me. I got the usual call from Jerry around 6. Hello? Kyle, there's a Sasquatch terrorizing hikers on the Appalachia Trail. God damn it. There is also a fern wolf in the Martinsburg area. Okay, I'll get on it when Javier gets here. Javier arrived at 10 minutes late. I chewed him out on the way to Martinsburg. We arrived at the location of the mauling 40 minutes later. I jumped out of my truck with Javier following close behind. I got my guns out of my truck and a 6 foot piece of bronze American wire. For those of you that don't know, a fern wolf is a wolf the size of a mastiff, with a jaw that can unhinge and swallow a human whole. It has claws as sharp as knives and nearly as large. It has the strength of Hercules on steroids. My AR was loaded with bronze bullets and my revolver was loaded with silver ones. It wasn't hard to track down the wolf. There was a trail of blood that led right to her. When we found her, I told Javier the plan. You get in front of her and shoot her in the legs. I'll come up from behind and wrap this around her. I held up the wire. Got it. Javier said. He ran to the front of the wolf and got her attention. He started shooting at her, hitting every shot in her legs. I ran up and I wrapped the wolf in the bronze wire and she started to sizzle, screaming in pain. She was immobilized and in a lot of pain. I picked her up and I threw her in the bed of my truck. Jerry likes to rehabilitate fern wolves and keep them as pets. I called Jerry and he started over to my location. He arrived at 10 minutes later in his 2020 Ford F-350 pickup truck. He took the wolf, wired $2,000 to my bank account. Fern wolves are worth a ton of money. And then he drove off. He then went to the location of the Sasquatch. On the way there we talked about women and such. 
He got to the location of the Sasquatch sighting and got out of the truck. The Sasquatch found us before we found him. He stepped out into the trail and faced us. We raised our guns and yelled, Put your hands up. He did. My name is Miguel. Please, if you're gonna do it, do it. Shoot me. I could hear his voice quiver. Get on your knees, please. He did. I walked up and I chained his hands together. He was crying. Miguel, it's okay. I'm not gonna shoot you. Thank you. He said crying. I only chained your hands because I don't think you will, but it's possible you could try and kill me. I won't. Good to know. Javier, call Jerry and ask what he wants us to do if one surrenders. Javier made the call while I sat chatting with Miguel. Javier came back. Kyle, can you talk for a second? Yeah. I assured Miguel that I'd be right back. We walked a shot distance down the trail. What did he say? He told me to shoot him. What? I'm not letting you shoot him. Look at him, he hasn't done anything. We looked back and Miguel was playing with a beetle that had crawled onto his hand. He was watching and laughing while it crawled all over him. I agree, I don't want to shoot him. I say we let him go and tell Jerry that he ran and we couldn't get him. Sounds like a plan. I walked back to Miguel and unchained him. Come on man, stand up, you're free to go. Really? Thank you so much. Every other hunter has tried to kill me. He started crying again. Hey, it's okay, Miguel. I need you to leave the area, though. Otherwise, they're going to send another hunter after you. I'll give you an hour's head start before I call my boss and say that you ran off. They'll send a search party out. They never go more than five miles from the escape point. Can you run five miles in an hour? He smiled. Yep. We'll get a move on, pal. Maybe we'll meet again someday. He stood up and wrapped me in a bear hug. A Sasquatch hug? I can't breathe, Miguel. Oh, sorry, sir. It's okay. Your hour starts now. He smiled, turned, and then ran off down the trail. I turned around and Javier was smiling. Genuinely smiling. I've never seen it before. Do I get a hug like that, you big, ugly teddy bear? Shut up, before I dress you up in an animal costume and turn you over to Jerry. We laughed. Waited the hour and told Jerry that the Sasquatch got away. After some cussing, he accepted it and we went home. And here I am writing this. I just heard something walking outside the door to my room. It sounds big and it has claws. I'm gonna check it out. If I don't come back and you find this Javier, post this story and continue this post thread. So that's it. I'll update as details come in on Kyle's case. The police found Kyle's revolver in the woods behind his house. Javier Garcia, you're under arrest for the kidnapping of Kyle Redinger. Hello all, it's been a while I know and damn do I have a story for you. First off, I should tell you that I am indeed alive. Yes, your sexy monster hunter lived through his kidnapping, despite my best efforts to the contrary. So let's start filling y'all in. First, I should start with what happened on the night of my disappearance. I understand Javier posted my last entry even though it was unfinished. Anyway, after I heard the heavy, thumping, scratchy footsteps working their way back my hallway, I got up to check it out, taking my large hunting knife with me. Now I guarantee I looked absolutely stupid emerging dramatically from my room, in a union suit with my hair messy, and my beard in dire need of some oil, holding a knife the size of my head. So I walked out of my room and immediately saw the source of the noise. There is a set of yellow glowing eyes at the end of my hallway. 
I quickly reached out to my right and I flicked the light switch. The light turned on revealing the beast at the end of the hall. It was the skinwalker. She came for me and I couldn't believe it. Here was this deformed wolf looking ass at the end of my hallway. And now at this point, the song playing through my bluetooth speaker in my room switched to Country Squire by Tyler Childers. Perfect fighting music. You might want to listen to it before you read the next part, so you understand how amazing this shit was. The skinwalker spoke. Kyle, I have come. It is time for your demise. Come willingly and I will make it quick. If you refuse to listen to my demands, I will have to rip a few limbs off then. Hmm. I reply pretending to stroke my beard thoughtfully. I'm gonna go with option C. Screw you and your demands. This obviously pissed her off and she snarled while saying. So be it then. Acting all macho and shit. Let's go. I promptly replied. She bolted towards me and lunged. I kicked her in the face sending her sprawling. I was in need to let out some anger so I let her get back up so I could fight her some more. She got to her feet shakily. She turned and growled at me again and ran at me. I thought she was going to lunge at me again but I was mistaken as she plowed through my legs. I landed flat on my back and I had the air forced from my lungs. She padded over and stood looking down at me. Without hesitation, I stabbed upward. The knife impaled her chest and she scampered back whimpering and growling in pain. I rolled over and I got back to my feet. She healed around the knife which meant I wasn't going to get it back without killing her. I charged her and tackled her. Once I was on top of her, I started punching. Blood ran down her face and pooled onto the floor, coating her black fur. I attempted to strangle her, but after a few seconds of her kicking, her foot connected with my chest and sent me flying across the hallway. I hit the wall on the other end, cracking the drywall. I fell to the floor and I lay there, stunned for a few seconds. She walked back up to me and raked her claw down my face from my hairline over my left eye and down to my jawbone, leaving four large gashes and making my left eye useless. She then bit me in the foot and started to drag me away. I was in shock and I couldn't fight back. Hell, I couldn't even scream. I blacked out somewhere along the way and woke up sometime later to the skinwalker standing over me and glaring down. I could only see out of my right eye. My face was sticky with what I assumed was dried blood. There was a searing pain in my right foot which I took as I wouldn't be walking out of here. The skinwalker was now back in human form. She was treating my facial wounds. I assumed she was trying to treat an infection. I tried to pull away but only fell over on the dirty shack floor. I tried to crawl away feebly. She grabbed me by the remaining scraps of my union suit and drug me back into the chair. I didn't try to get away anymore after that. After that, many days passed. At least six or seven, but I'm not quite sure. After time had passed, there was a commotion one night. There was a loud roar, like that of a freaking dinosaur. Kind of felt like I was in Jurassic Park for a second. And then a black shape crashed through the ceiling of my shack. It was the skinwalker. She was trapped under a beam now. I began calling for help, and after a second or two... I heard Javier's voice. Hey, I found him. Over here, hurry. Suddenly I saw him in the doorway. Freaking jackass, Kyle. I had to break out of a maximum security prison to save your ass. He said to me while chuckling. I let out a weak chuckle and I tried to get up, failed and I hit the ground hard. Suddenly I saw two other faces in the doorway. One was my red-haired boss, Jerry. The other one was, it was Miguel. They had come for me. Jerry and Javier helped me up. They each supported me on one side and helped me to Javier's truck. Once there, Jerry spoke. Kyle, 
You've been put on leave from this point until this time next month. I'll clean this up. Javier, get him home, please. Now hang on a freaking second. I'm ending that thing that tried to kill me. Give me a gun, I said. After a second, Jerry replied, Fair enough. Here. He tossed me the shotgun that was strapped to his shoulder. I walked back to the shack with help from Javier and Jerry, and found the skinwalker still trapped. I aimed the shotgun at her head and spoke. What do you say in defense? I asked. Screwed you. Just because you kill me doesn't mean you win, you know that right? My death means nothing, nothing. We will win. We will win the war. You will be portrayed by one of your own. You will die. We will always win, Kyle. I'm not convinced. I replied and I pulled the trigger, blowing her head off. I went to thank Miguel. After I did, I went to go back to the truck, but I heard a commotion behind me. I turned and saw Jerry holding his pistol to Miguel's head. Miguel was unable to escape Jerry's iron grip. Jerry, what the hell are you doing? Let him go, he saved me. I screamed at him. While you were gone, Kyle, I instated a kill on sight clause for all cryptids. I'm following protocol. Stay out of it. He pushed Miguel away and Miguel turned to look at me with a betrayed look in his face. And then the shot rang out. Blood splattered the front of Miguel's torso and on me. He fell to the ground and lay there unmoving. I tried to run to him but ended up stumbling there. I sat by his side crying. I heard the sound of Javier punching Jerry but I didn't care. My boss had just shot the creature that had saved my life. Miguel didn't deserve to die. It was that moment that I decided I would no longer be loyal to Cryptax. Javier ended up beating the shit out of Jerry. Jerry just said that he deserved it and Javier took me home. I got home and I passed out of my bed, not even bothering to take off my bloody, dirty clothes. This was a month ago. I am scheduled to take my first return call tonight. We'll see what happens. Hello all. It's been quite a while since my last update and I do apologize for that. My life has actually been going fairly well. Until about an hour ago anyway. Since we last spoke, I've gotten a girlfriend. You didn't think I could do it, did you? I began taking online spelling and grammar classes. Yes, I saw your comments. I adopted a Rottweiler and gotten a day job, along with submitting my two-week notice to Jerry. Well, here we go. This will be my last entry ever. I'm done with everything. I met Rachel back in October. She worked with me at Sheets, my day job, and we hit it off well. And soon we were exchanging phone numbers. Soon after we began dating, and now she's gone. Gone for good, and she's never coming back. She can't come back. I guess I should start from the beginning for this to make sense. Today, Rachel and I invited Javier over for dinner. He showed up at around 5. Rachel and I began preparing dinner around 6. I grilled some chicken and she sautéed vegetables. We sat down to eat around 7 and finished at around 7.30. Cracked open a couple beers and a bottle of wine. We messed around and just hung out until around 9 o'clock. Javier was pulling out his coat when there came a massive thump at the door, rattling it on his hinges. Rachel screamed, dropping her wine glass, shattering it. Javier and I drew our guns and trained them on the door. Rachel, go to my room and lock the door. I said, as another massive thump came on the door and it was beginning to crack. Go. She ran back to my room, heard the door latch and lock. Another thump, and a massive crunch as the door broke off the hinges. A massive seven foot tall Jerry walked in, a sawed off shotgun leveled at Javier. 
What the hell do you do? Is all Javier was able to say before the gun went off. Javier fell to his knees, clutching his stomach. Jerry leveled the gun to his head and looked at me, my gun still raised. Put the gun down, Kyle. You sick asshole. I'll kill you. I pulled the hammer back on my revolver. Jerry raised an eyebrow and cocked his shotgun for the second shot. Put it down or I'll blow his head off. Defeated, I dropped my gun, and I dropped to my knees. Kyle, you have two options. Die, or continue your position in my company. Screw you. I guess you've chosen. And then I heard a scream, loud and animalistic. I turned and saw Rachel running at Jerry with my bowie knife raised. He turned, raised his gun and fired. Rachel fell to the ground, a gaping hole in her chest. The shot killed her instantly. Before he could turn around, I picked up my gun and shot him in the back three times, and then ran up and kicked him in the back of the head, and shot him in the head, killing him. I ran to Javier, knowing Rachel was already gone, and I checked his pulse. He was still alive, but fading fast. I tried to put pressure on the wound, but it didn't help. He stared at me with glossed over eyes, as a trail of blood ran from the corner of his mouth, and the pool of blood he was laying in grew in size. I sat next to him, defeated, knowing that he was gone. I'm sorry, my friend. My voice was somber. Now as I sit in my living room with my best friend, my girlfriend, and my ex-boss all dead around me, and my gun lying on the table next to me, reloaded with one more shot, the shots that will take my life, I write this. As soon as I post this, I will end it. I just thought you all would like some closure. Thank you everybody for the support. This is Kyle Redinger, signing off for the last time. What the heck? What just happened? I'm at home, still on the clock, covered in blood, and I just got this call. No, 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 this isn't happening. This isn't real. Jesus Christ. I really wish that I were kidding you right now, but I'm not. Dispatch wants me to go to this lady's house and investigate. Of course, they don't believe me that a toilet ate her son. I'm sure that they believe she's insane, but I know better. The first time I had heard something so absurd was over a month ago during dinner. It was Taco Tuesday. Dad, Billy says that there's a monster in his toilet at home. Clara sounded very concerned. Clara, Billy is only trying to scare you. I assure you there is no monster in the toilet. Or in anybody else's toilets for that matter. I chuckled to myself. Four-year-olds are very creative when it comes to storytelling. No, Dad. She said as bits of taco fell from her mouth. I don't think he wanted to scare me. He seemed really scared. I'm sure someone else must have told him a story about a snake in the toilet or something. Or maybe they played a prank on him. But there aren't snakes or monsters in any toilets. Someone's just trying to scare you kids. No one said anything about snakes. What's a prank? I smacked my hand to my head. I really didn't feel like answering. It had been a long day and all I really wanted was for my sweet angel daughter to kindly shut the hell up and go to bed. Instead, I found myself trying to explain to a four-year-old what a prank was. Remember when you drew that spider on the window to try and scare me? Yeah, she giggled. That was funny. That's a prank. A trick that you play on someone. And while it might be funny to you, it's not always funny to the person that you do it to. 
but you thought it was funny. I let out a sigh. I had no interest in explaining to my daughter why I thought her 13-legged spider in the window was funny, even though I'm slightly terrified of spiders. It's getting late. Let's clean up dinner and get ready for bed. Grandma will be here in the morning when I go to work. With my daughter finally tucked into bed, I slouched into the recliner and I turned on the television. I closed my eyes, but I could still hear the drone of voices from the television, although I couldn't quite make out what they were saying. I felt as if I were sinking deeper and deeper into the chair, when suddenly I was startled awake. Dad! Dad! Come quick! What now? I thought. I grumbled as I fought my way out of the recliner. Dad, are you coming in here? Hello? The voice was coming from the bathroom. I assumed she needed toilet paper. What? I said sternly. Dad, the toilet. I can feel it. I can feel it on my butt. I was wrong. Yeah, and? I didn't try to hide the annoyance in my voice. Not just the seat, Dad, the air. I can feel it blowing on my butt, just like Billy said. She sounded freaked out. Let me get this straight. You can feel the toilet breathing on your butt. I raised an eyebrow. No, not the toilet, the monster in the toilet. I can feel the monster in there breathing. Look and see. All right, hop off there and let's take a look together. I didn't want to encourage her behavior, but she seemed genuinely freaked out, so I thought that I would put her mind at ease. We both peeked over the toilet bowl. To Clara's surprise, it was completely empty. Nothing but a shiny white porcelain bowl. See, does it look like it's breathing on you? No, it looks hungry to me. Hungry? I chuckled, confused. I think the only thing it's hungry for are those tacos that we had for dinner. I'll make sure to feed it before breakfast. I laughed. You gross dad. Clara giggled. We washed our hands and I carried her to her bedroom and I tucked her back into bed. I wish that this was the end of the story. A silly girl, a tired dad and an empty toilet. But that wouldn't be a story worth telling. I don't dare waste the last minutes of my life telling you such a boring story. About two weeks after the hungry toilet incident, Clara came home from school crying. Dad, it's Billy. He's not coming to school anymore. He's gone. He's gone. Clara buried her head into my chest. I knew what she was referring to. Her good friend Billy had passed away. I wasn't sure how yet, there was still an ongoing investigation. The body hadn't been found. Well, not the entire body at least. There was a part of a leg and arm left dangling from the toilet. The ends looked as if someone had stuck them in a wood chipper. There was blood everywhere, on the walls, the floor, the ceiling. The toilet bowl was overflowing. Shards of bone and blood hair. Shreds of skin and cloth. I was certain that there was a madman on the loose. Someone had to be mad to have done something like this to a four-year-old. And the way they left the body, as if they were playing some kind of practical joke. Disgusting. Of course, I didn't tell Clara what I knew of Billy. She was only four. I always knew the day would come when my sweet girl would have to learn about death, but I never imagined it would happen so soon, and not like this. I did what I could to console her, telling her that Billy was in a better place. We went and picked up some flowers for the funeral and placed them in a toy dump truck. Clara said that Billy was always fascinated with trucks. The service was lovely and most of the students from the school attended. 
The PTA set up a fund and raised money for Billy's family to cover cost of the funeral, burial, and to help pay bills while Billy's parents were out of work grieving. A lot of people from the community donated. I was always surprised at how the community came together during hard times like this. For several days after the funeral, Clara wouldn't stop talking about Billy and the toilet. She was convinced that a monster in the toilet had eaten him. He said that he could feel its breath. It felt like warm air coming out of the toilet. Clara, I'm sure the only warm air he felt was just Billy passing gas. No, he said he could feel it breathing. He said when he looked down at the bowl, he could see it moving. Like this. Clara demonstrated by moving her stomach in and out. And he said that it licked him. Clara, that's enough. I'm sure he just felt water splash up, like when you have a big poop and it splashes into the toilet bowl. But that's enough. Let's not talk about monsters in the toilet anymore. It's upsetting. Monsters aren't real. I lied. Toilet monsters aren't real. But human monsters were very real. And unfortunately, we still hadn't found the one who had murdered Billy. I just wanted it to stop. All the talk about monsters. I knew that she was grieving, and that grief looked different for everyone. But this had gone on for long enough. She was starting to upset other kids in the school with her talk of toilet monsters. I just wanted it to come to an end, and I wanted to find the madman that did this so that my little girl would be safe. I found no such man, but I did find something mad. With Billy's case still open and no leads, I ended up working nights at the station. I was just lucky enough that I was usually out patrolling an area close to home right around Clara's bedtime. My mother stayed over at the house with Clara while I worked, and every night I happened to be patrolling close by. I would sneak by the house to tuck my sweet angel into bed. Is she asleep yet? I asked my mother. No. Her voice was hoarse. She's not, and I'm out of cigs. Stop at the store and get your mom a pack, would ya? Mom, you know I refuse to enable you. For Christ's sakes, Jake. It's cigarettes, not heroin. Please, go get me a pack. Mom, I'm serious. I won't buy your cancer sticks. If you want them, you'll have to get them for yourself, but I won't. Before I could finish, my mother snatched up her purse. I'll just go and get them now while you tuck Claire into bed. I'll be back. Come on, Mom. I don't have time. I'm on the clock. Where's Claire anyway? She's in the bathroom. She had to go. Too many tacos. I'll be right back. She yelled, and her voice fading as the door slammed behind her. I rolled my eyes. That woman and her damn cigarettes. I went to the utility closet to get an air freshener. I hated the smell of cigarettes. Dad! I dropped the air freshener as Clara shrieked from the bathroom. I had never heard her scream that way. I bolted for the bathroom and I threw open the door. To my horror, Clara and I were both wrong about the monster in the toilet. There was no monster in the toilet. The toilet was the monster. Daddy, help! Clara screamed, trapped as a giant tongue arose from the toilet and wrapped itself around her. I couldn't believe my eyes. How could something that size even come from something that small? And what was it made of? It appeared to be made of porcelain, yet it behaved as if it were a giant tentacle, wrapping tightly around Clara's body. I reached for her arm, but the tongue snatched her up to the ceiling. Damn my wife, she has to be right. Even from beyond the grave, I could hear her voice, bitter and critical, taunting me. I always told you we didn't need a house with tall ceilings. Now look at the situation you're in. I grabbed at the tongue itself, but to my surprise, it was hard, just like porcelain. How the hell was it moving this way? This was unreal. 
I reached for my nightstick, and I slammed it against the tongue, but it did nothing. How is this possible? It moves as if it's living, looks as if it's porcelain, yet it seems to be even harder. I contemplated whether or not to pull out my gun. I could shoot it, sure, but I could hit Clara. I didn't know what to do, so I continued to hit the thing with my nightstick as hard as I could, over and over again as I shouted, Let her go! Give me back my daughter! The ground beneath my feet began to vibrate as the porcelain beast let out a roar. Its voice sounded mechanical in nature, like a combination between that of a bear and a machine. It was unlike anything I had ever heard before. What the hell is this? This isn't real, it can't be. Clara screamed as I hit the tongue and the bowl of the toilet. It roared again and I fell into the sink as the toilet bowl grew ten times its size almost instantly. The force of the growing bowl knocked me back. I tried to pick myself off the floor when I slept. I looked down and realized that I was lying in a puddle of my own blood. I reached for my head and it was throbbing. I must have knocked it on the sink as the toilet bowl knocked me back. I attempted again to pick myself up, but the floor was too slick. All I wanted to do was save my daughter, but I couldn't even pick myself up off the floor. My hands trembled as I reached for my gun. Clara screamed again and the toilet roared. The floor rumbled, shaking loose the ceramic tiles. The bowl looked as if it were breathing, in and out but erratically, as if it were in pain. And that's when I saw it. Rising up out of the bowl, layers upon layers of teeth. There must have been thousands of them. The first row spun faster and faster as another ring of teeth emerged, spinning in the opposite direction. I fumbled around for my gun and I pointed it as low as I could, in hopes that I didn't hit Clara. More and more teeth emerged in rings, spinning faster and faster. I pulled the trigger and the gun let out a bang. The toilet roared again as the bullet ricocheted off the bowl and broke a vase on the opposite side of the room. I couldn't believe my eyes. What the hell was happening? I let out a scream as the tongue of the bowl slipped almost instantly back into the bowl, directly through the rings of teeth below, and Clara falling right behind it. I scrambled around, crawling for the bowl as fast as I could, but it was too late. My face was met with a splatter of blood and guts as the thousands of tiny teeth tore my daughter to pieces. The walkie-talkie in my belt let out a beep as a voice came through. We've got a 5150 over on Robinson Bridge. This lady thinks a toilet ate her son. I could hear the laughter in her voice. If I had received this call any other night, I probably would have been laughing too. But now I know. The next time you're on the toilet, and you feel a rush of warm air on your bottom, please run. If you think you've only felt the splash from a very solid turd hitting the water, you are wrong. If you thought that it was a loose hair rubbing ever so slightly against your bottom, it isn't. It's the tongue of a porcelain beast, and that beast is hungry. I've tried calling for help, but my coworkers think that I've gone mad. I only wish that they were right. Without my Clara, there is nothing for me to live for anymore. So I'm writing this to you now, as I lie in a puddle of my own blood, waiting for the porcelain bees to take me too.